Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, Napod. Napod features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for Napod, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to Napod.xyz if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. Serenity prayer. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, courage to change the things we can, and wisdom to know the difference. I will not mind it then. Okay, before we get into the first three steps, I'd like to uh, first thank a couple people for coming bright and early this morning. As we know, it's kind of a rainy, dreary morning and to boot at 7 o'clock. So uh, I'd like to uh, thank Kathy for coming and also Peter who came all the way from Freehold. I believe Peter has to travel about 50 miles to get here. So uh, Pete was here bright and early with me and, and helped us set up. So I'd like to really thank you guys. So welcome to the Wednesday morning 7 a.m. beginners classes. During the next four weeks, you will learn how to recover from alcoholism by taking the 12 steps as outlined in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. The program of AA is a spiritually based plan of action that will remove the compulsion to drink and enable you to live a life that is happy, useful, and whole. AA instructional meetings are said to have been started in Cleveland, Ohio by Clarence S. in the early 1940s. After the publication of the Saturday Evening Post article about Alcoholics Anonymous, AA started growing so rapidly it became impossible for the early members to individually take new prospects through the steps. These meetings were held for the purpose of acquainting both the old and new members with the 12 steps upon which our program is based. So that all 12 steps could be covered in a minimum amount of time, they were divided into four classifications, and one meeting each week was devoted to each of the four subdivisions. Now, in front of you, everyone should have a pamphlet that's entitled AA's Forgotten Beginning, the Alcoholics Anonymous Beginner Classes. And this pamphlet is actually a transcribed talk given by Wally P., who's uh, um, an AA historian and an archivist from, um, from Arizona. And all this is is a transcribed talk of his, and it has a lot of the the information and history about AA beginners classes, were, uh, which were predominantly popular in the early 1940s. So uh, when you get a chance, try to review this pamphlet, and uh, hopefully it will give you a lot of the history of this thing. Each group has developed its own guidelines for teaching the beginners classes. However, all these groups had something in common. They provide a safe, structured environment in which newcomers learn the principles of AA, take the steps, and have spiritual experiences. The book, Alcoholics Anonymous, is our textbook for recovery. Does everyone have a big book with them? Okay. We'll be using the big book extensively during the next four weeks. As the title of the book implies, we are an anonymous society. You can be assured we will protect your anonymity at this and any other meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. The big book was first published in 1939. It was written by several of the first 100 people to recover from alcoholism. Since then, alcoholics have used it all over the world as a program for recovery. So that we can complete each class within an hour and still provide ample time for questions, please write down anything that you do not understand or need clarified and save it until the end of the session. Questions can be answered at that time. The big book is the only book we'll discuss during these sessions except for a possible reference to the 12 Steps and 12 Traditions or the Little Red Book, which was at one time used in conjunction conjunction with the big book in meetings similar to this one in Minneapolis, Minnesota and Miami, Florida. 
If you cannot find something I say in our big book, consider it to be my opinion rather than fact. I'll do my best to keep my opinions out of these discussions. I'm here to pass on the AA program as written and practiced by the early members. I am not here to present my interpretation of the program. Now, in order for this process to work during the next four weeks, certain guidelines will need to be followed by the people that are going to go through the steps with us and for the sponsor. The newcomer's primary obligation is to be here every week for the next four weeks. If you do not have transportation, your sponsor will help you make the necessary arrangements. It's our experience that this process works best when the sponsor and newcomer attend all four of these classes together. Because some of us have difficulties reading when we're newly sober, I'll be doing the reading from the big book during these meetings. If you brought your big book with you, please follow along as I read. Sometimes we'll be going through the material rather fast. If you're unable to follow along, it's okay. Just listen the best you can. Remember, we're here to take the actions that, that the big book prescribes, not just to study the book, okay? We're not just going to be reading the book. We're going to be doing what the instructions say in it. If you take the steps as described in the big book, you will recover from alcoholism. It is imperative that when writing your four-step inventory, which uh, will be beginning next week, you'll receive help and guidance from your sponsor or members from this group. There's a few people here that have uh, been through this work a numerous amount of times, and, and uh, we can offer assistance to you. Many people try to do their four steps by themselves and wonder why many weeks or months later they're still not finished. It's very dangerous to go it alone in spiritual matters. That's why as part of our second week together, we'll be starting our inventories together in this meeting. We understand that this phase of our development can get quite personable. That's why the fifth step will, of course, not be taken in class, obviously, but should be completed between the second and third weeks. And the last guideline is sponsors should call or visit with the newcomers or those who are going through the steps frequently to see how he or she is doing and to offer encourage, encouragement and assistance through the work. Make use of the phone list that this meeting offers. Uh, there's a blank phone list by the coffee pot. And if you'd like the people that have gone through this process before, uh, put your name on the list. And this list will be going around throughout the meetings. And if your name is on that list, that means that you're willing to have people give you a call to uh, offer encouragement while you go through this work. Uh, it's kind of like a sharing network type phone list, and uh, it's quite different from the traditional phone list that most meetings use. Usually you give the newcomer the phone list and you say, call these people if you're having a problem. Well, this is kind of the, the opposite, where the people that are uh, that have been around uh, the fellowship for a while and that have done the work, they'll call you to give you help. And that's the way it was done in the early days. The newcomer didn't go to the sponsor the sponsor reached out to the newcomer and helped him or her. Okay, can I get a show of hands this morning on how many people would like to take the 12 steps with us during the next four weeks? Okay, great. Of those that raised your hands, how many do not have a sponsor? Okay, we all got sponsors then, great. Um, if there was anyone here this morning that didn't have a sponsor, what would happen, and this was done in the early days, after the meeting, we would all hook up together, and a sponsor would be assigned, okay? Again, the newcomer or, or the person that wants to do the work doesn't go up to the sponsor and say, uh, you know, I need your help. The sponsor goes to him or her and says, I'm here to help you. You know, the, AA, the hand of AA is here, reached out to you. Okay, it's vital that newcomers get a sponsor to guide them through the steps during the next four weeks. Um, now let's start the session by turning to the forward of the big book, which is on Roman numeral page 13. That's XIII. We're going to start on the first paragraph, which says, We have Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered, ED, recovered, from the seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. 
To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. So the big book tells us immediately that its purpose is to show alcoholics how to recover from alcoholism. Until this book was written, there was no hope for alcoholics. Now anyone who is willing to follow the directions they have provided can recover. During this sec session, we'll be reading through material in the big book and drawing from our own experiences to help us answer the following questions. Am I alcoholic? Do I need help? And am I willing to take certain actions to receive that help? Okay, let's keep those three questions in mind as we go through the work this morning. So let's begin our journey with the first step. Step one, we admit it we're powerless over alcohol, dash, that our, that our lives had become unmanageable. Surrender is essential in order to recover from alcoholism, and the first 51 pages of the big book is devoted to the first part of the surrender process, which is to admit we have a problem. It suggests that you read through these pages to find your truth with alcohol and the illness of alcoholism. The book begins by describing the physical and mental symptoms of alcoholism. Later, the book asks us to acknowledge that we're alcoholics. Before we can do this, we need to know what an alcoholic is, right? We'll be using information from the doctor's opinion, chapters 1, 2, and 3, and the first page of chapter 4 to determine this. Let's start on Roman numeral page 24 in the second paragraph. That's XXIV. It's going to be in the doctor's opinion. It's actually the second page of the doctor's opinion if you have a third edition. Okay, it says, the physician who, at our request, gave us this letter has been kind enough to enlarge upon his views in another statement which follows. In this statement, he confirms, we who have suffered alcoholic torture must believe that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as the mind. It did not satisfy us to be told that we could not control our drinking just because we are maladjusted to life that we were in full flight from reality, or we were outright mental defectives. These things were true to some extent, in fact, to a considerable extent with some of us. <laughs> You're looking at one of them. <laughs> but we are sure that our bodies were sickened as well. In our belief, any picture of the alcoholic which leaves out the physical factor is incomplete. The doctor's theory that we have an allergy to alcohol interests us. As layman, our opinion as to its soundness may, of course, mean little. But as ex-problem drinkers, we can say that his explanation makes good sense. It explains many things for which we cannot account otherwise. Let's turn now to Roman numeral page 26, XXVI, where in the first paragraph, Dr. Silkworth further describes the alcoholic's physical reaction to alcohol after it's ingested into the body. And for anyone that's not familiar with our history, Dr. Silkworth uh, is the physician that worked at Towns Hospital when Bill, when Bill Wilson was uh, going through his pinch, and actually Dr. Silkworth helped Bill to get sober. Dr. Sil Silkworth uh, gave Bill the vital information that was needed for not only for Bill to get sober, but also when Bill carried the message to Dr. Bob, all right, Bill told Dr. Bob what Dr. Silkworth had told him about how the alcoholic is different in the bodily and mental sense. Before this, nobody heard about this information. So Dr. Silkworth says, we believe and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomena of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all, and once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon things human, their problems pile up on them, and become astonishingly, astonishingly difficult to solve. Notice that Dr. Silk, Silkworth referred to our physical reaction to alcohol as an allergy, and after one drink, the phenomena of craving develops. 
At the time the big book was written, very little was known about why the alcoholic reacts to alcohol differently than other people. Since then, science and the medical community have discovered some things. We've learned that the body of the alcoholic is physically different. The liver and the pancreas of the alcoholic process alcohol at one-third to one-tenth the rate of the non-alcoholic's pancreas and liver. As alcohol enters the body, it breaks down into various components, one of which is acetate. We know now that acetate triggers the phenomenon of craving. In a normal drinker, the acetate moves through the system quickly and exits. But that doesn't happen in us. In us, the acetate is not processed out. So by staying in our body, it triggers a craving for a second drink. We have a second drink, putting in us two times as much acetate. And that makes us want to drink twice as much as the normal drinker. So we have another drink. Then having three times the craving as a normal drinker, we have another. You can see from that point how we have no control over how much we drink. The craving cycle has begun. Once the acetate accumulates in your body, and that begins to happen with the first drink, you will crave another if you're an alcoholic. And how many times did we think it'd be nice just to have one drink to relax, right? But you had more. Now you can see why. And this can never change if you're a real alcoholic. So let's go to the fourth paragraph on that same page. And Dr. Silkworth describes the common drinking, common drinking cycle of an alcoholic and begins to describe the second factor of the alcoholic illness. We know the first factor is the abnormal reaction of the body, the physical craving. The second factor is the mental obsession. Dr. Silkworth's going to describe the mental state of the alcoholic before we pick up the first drink. He says, men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot after a time differentiate the true from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. Now see if you can identify with this. They are restless, irritable, and discontented. Unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Drinks which they see others taking with impunity. The word impunity means with no repercussions, no effects. You know, the alcoholic sits there at the bar and sees these non-alcoholic drinking drinkers taking a couple drinks, and these non-alcoholics aren't going home crashing cars, throwing, throwing the cats and beating the wife. You know, that doesn't happen with the non-alcoholics because the alcoholic reacts differently. After they had succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, the phenomena of craving develops. The physical reaction of the body develops. They pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over, and unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope for his recovery. If a mind didn't lie to us and tell us that it's okay to drink, we would never trigger the physical allergy which produces the craving for more and more alcohol. So, we have an abnormal reaction of the body and an obsession of the mind which dooms us to drink again. It is important to note that the body of an alcoholic can never recover, but the mind can. That was great hope for me when I found that out. If alcoholism were solely a physical disease, then we could just stop drinking, and that would be the solution, right? How many times have you heard, just don't drink, you know? Nancy Reagan had a solution back in the back in the 80s, just say no. Well, just say no doesn't work for a guy like me, because when you tell me just say no, I say yes, you know? But the mental factor is why just quitting is not enough. That's why Dr. Silkworth says we need an entire psychic change. That's the change of our mind, how we react to alcohol. On page XXVII, Roman numeral 27, Dr. Silkworth says that all we have to do is follow a few simple rules and we won't have the desire for alcohol. 
We can never be cured, but the problem won't exist for us as long as we, we remain in fit spiritual condition. Those few simple rules Dr. Silkworth talks about are the actions we're going to take in the 12 steps to bring about the entire psychic change. Let's go to Roman numeral page 28, paragraph 1. Okay, he says, There are many situations which arise out of the phenomena of craving which cause men to make the supreme sacrifice rather than the fight. Right? What he's talking about there is suicide. God bless you. You know, he's talking about once the phenomena of craving develops, you know, and this happens over and over and over again, and we're doomed to keep on drinking, and we're doomed to, to continue to start drinking because the obsession of the mind, some of us have no choice but to make the supreme sacrifice. That's why so many alcoholics, uh, drunk and sober, commit suicide. And that's what he's talking about in this paragraph. This concludes our readings from the doctor's opinion. During the next week, please read Chapter 1, Bill's Story. Bill W. is the New York stock analyst who is one of our co-founders. His story is a perfect example of an alcoholic. Some people have difficulty identifying with Bill because he was such a low-bottom, hopeless alcoholic. Here, as with the rest of the book, we ask that you look for similarities rather than differences. See where you can identify with Bill as he continues to use alcohol long after it has become a problem for him. Now, it was suggested to me to try to identify with the way Bill felt, the way Bill thought, and the way Bill drank. If I try to identify with Bill in those three areas, there's going to be a lot of things in his story that I'll be able to identify with. Again, the way he felt, thought, and drank. The first eight pages of Bill's story give us an example of the problem of the alcoholic. The last eight pages describe the spiritual solution that Bill follows. The only thing I'm going to read from Bill's story this morning is the first full paragraph on page eight because it describes so well what we alcoholics call our bottom. Okay, page eight, first full paragraph. Bill writes, no words can tell of the loneliness and despair I found in that bitter morass of self-pity. Anybody identify with that? This is when Bill hits bottom. Quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. Now, if you felt like this in the past, then you identify with Bill. If Bill says he's a real alcoholic, then you might be too. We're going to skip chapter 2, there is a solution for now, but I urge you to read it during the next week. And the only reason we're skipping around like this is so we have enough time to cover all the information and to take the steps uh, in, an, in an hour in each meeting. But it's imperative that you go from cover to cover in this book and read all the information. Okay, let's turn to page 30. And we're going to read the first page of chapter 3, more about alcoholism. It says, most of us have been unwilling to admit we're real alcoholics. No person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people. The idea that somehow... Someday, he will be, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. Next paragraph says, we learn that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we're alcoholics. This is the first step of recovery. The delusion that we're like other people or presently may be has to be smashed. Thanks for passing the, the basket, Kathy. We, uh, we have a seventh tradition. There are, are no dues or fees, but uh, we do need to pay rent for this church, and it covers uh, the expenses for coffee and any other conference-approved literature. And if there were to be any uh, monies left over after the donation of uh, 
to the church and for the coffee and anything, there would be a contribution donated to uh, the two ser- service entities, um, New Jersey Area 44, uh, the, gen- the, the General Service Office in uh, South Plainfield, and also the Intergroup Office, which is uh, nearby in Union. Okay, back to the book. So in these paragraphs, the book confirms that we are different from the average non-alcoholic drinker in both the bodily and mental sense. They restate that we continue to believe in the lie that we can somehow control and enjoy our drinking. This is why this is a lie, that somehow, someday I could control and and enjoy my drinking. Because when I was trying to control my drinking, I didn't enjoy it. And during the time I was enjoying my drinking, I certainly wasn't controlling it. You know, think back upon your experience. The book tells us again that if we continue to believe in the lie that our mind tells us and we continue to kill our bodies by drinking alcohol, then we're either going to go insane or die. The first step was stated in the second paragraph, and we'll be getting back to that statement in just a moment. Now let's briefly cover the examples that this chapter gives us describing the mental obsession we alcoholics have when it comes to alcohol. We're going to start with the first full paragraph on page 35. First paragraph on 35. What sort of thinking dominates an alcoholic who repeats time after time the desperate experiment of the first drink? Friends who have reasoned with him after a spree which has brought him to the point of divorce or bankruptcy, excuse me, are mystified when he walks directly into a saloon. Why does he of what he is thinking? Now, the next few paragraphs and couple pages go on to describe a guy by the name of Jim, all right, and they give an example. Um, Due to a lack of time, we're not going to read from the book, but I'm going to kind of encapsulize Jim's story. Uh... You know, when you when you read through this, you can tell that Jim's a really nice guy. He's well liked by his friends and family. He inherited a car dealership uh, and was pretty successful for a time. Jim started drinking at uh, age 35, and a few years later was committed to an asylum. He was in touch with AA, and the old timers worked with him. They shared their stories and told Jim about the first two steps. He made a beginning but he failed to go forward with the spiritual program of action described in this book. He got drunk seven times in rapid succession. Each time, the old-timers worked with him. All right? Back then, they didn't, they didn't leave you out there just because you, you, you went in and out, in and out. You know, they continued to, to work with the wet drunk. Uh, he... He described, to, Jim described to the old timers what happened to him. Basically, because he failed to go ahead with the rest of the program, he succumbed to the lie that he could drink whiskey safely, uh, and his trivial excuse was if he poured it into, if he poured booze into milk, it wouldn't hurt him on a full stomach. Because Jim didn't continue the rest of the program and take the rest of the steps, he did not have the entire psychic change that Dr. Silkworth talks about and fell victim to the lie that he could drink safely. On page 37, our book describes that kind of thinking as pure insanity. The text says in the first full paragraph of the page, whatever the precise definition of the word may be, we call this plain insanity. How could such a lack of proportion of the ability to think straight be called anything else? Now, isn't that a perfect definition to to describe alcoholic insanity? The lack of proportion of the ability to think straight. We can't see the truth from the false when it comes to alcohol. The insanity of alcoholism is not all those crazy things we did while we were drinking, like crashing our cars, getting arrested, and hurting other people mentally and physically. You know, what the book talks about insanity being is for us to believe in the lie that, that we can have that first drink safely. For me to believe in a lie that I can drink successfully. Alright? Sure, it's crazy, uh, 
those things that I did were crazy, but the real insanity is thinking we can safely drink alcohol in the first place, even after all the pain, suffering, and humiliation we've gone through. Like Dr. Silkor said, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in the mind rather than the body. Let's wrap up our discussion of the physical and mental aspects of alcoholism by turning to the first page of Chapter 4, We Agnostics, at page 44. In the first paragraph, four lines down, the big book gives us a statement that, be, that can be turned into a question for us to answer. Okay, so we're going to try to determine if we have the mind and the body of an alcoholic. And since we're so few this morning, rather than uh, just asking uh, each person, we're just going to kind of answer this question as a group, and uh, a yes or a no will do fine. But we're, we're going to read this paragraph. Uh, go four lines down on page 44. If when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or if when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take, you're probably alcoholic. If that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. All right? So what I'm going to do now is ask this question. Uh, and this question is to help us determine if we have the mental and physical symptoms of alcoholism. All right? If when you honestly wanted to, could you quit drinking entirely by yourself? Yes or no? Okay. Or, when drinking, did you have little or no control over the amount you took? Debbie? Okay. Let's go through the questions again. If when you honestly wanted to, could you quit drinking entirely by yourself? Yes or no? Could you quit by yourself when you, even when you wanted to? When you were drinking, did you were there times that you that you tried to quit? Before you came to AA, were there times that you tried to quit drinking? Okay. Were you able to quit on your own? No. Okay. Now, when drinking, did you have little or no control over the amount you took while you were drinking? You said it before. You said you, you didn't have any control over the amount. How many times did you go into a bar or liquor store or wherever you drank? And this is for everyone now. You know, and you said, well, here's my theme song. I'm just going to have a couple. Right? What happened? A six-pack or two six-packs or a quart later, I'm beaten on the bar. What happened? I just walked in here to have a couple. I couldn't just have a couple. I had no control. Right? So if we all answer the, these questions to the affirmative, you know, if that be the case, the book says we're probably alcoholic. And we may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Now let's take a look at the third factor involved in the first step. This is a spiritual malady. All right? are, are we all clear on the, on, the me, on the mental and physical factors? Okay. Bill, so, we quit? Okay. All right. All right, we're going to look at the spiritual malady now, uh, and and this is the need for the second part of the first step, which says that our lives have become unmanageable. On page 44, the book says, when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. Let's turn to page 52. Let's look in the second paragraph for symptoms of a spiritual malady. And that's what we alcoholics suffer from all our lives. All right? Let's turn these statements into questions that can be answered for ourselves. These questions can be answered in the past tense, when I was drinking, or in the present tense, now, not drinking, suffering from an unmanageable spirit because of untreated alcoholism. As I read them, answer these questions for yourself to see if you had been or presently may be experiencing these symptoms in your life. First one, we were having trouble with personal relationships. 
and we include ourselves here. Does that apply to us? Okay. We couldn't control our emotional natures. Ever have up or down days? Does that apply? <laughs> Debbie's really identifying. We were prey. We were prey or had bouts of misery and depression. Does that apply? We couldn't make a living. They're talking about we couldn't have a successful life, no matter how hard we tried. Does that apply? We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. Ever worry about things? Is that applicable to us? We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. Okay? That's on 52, right in the middle of the page. Second paragraph down. And all we did was turn those statements into questions to see if we were suffering from the second half of the first step, the unmanageable spirit. So if several of those apply to you, your life really is unmanageable, and chances are you're suffering from a malady which only a spiritual experience or a spiritual awakening will conquer. Back on page 44 in the second paragraph, the book told us that we have only two alternatives. First one is to be doomed an alcoholic death, and the second one is to live on a spiritual basis. So if your choice is to live on a spiritual basis, rest assured that not only is a spiritual awakening possible, it is a guarantee, provided we keep an open mind and take the steps as described in the big book. We're going to begin this process of admittance with the first step. Before we do that, let's review exactly what we alcoholics suffer from. All right. If I can't drink safely because of the allergy of the body, and that's the first factor, and I can't stop drinking because of the accept, uh, ob obsession of the mind, that's the second factor, then I'm powerless over alcohol. That's the first half of the first step. And if I suffer from symptoms of a life run on self-will uh, that are described on page 52, then my life is unmanageable. That's the third factor of the first step. On page 30, let's go back now, the big book tells us exactly what we have to do to make the admission that we're real alcoholics. Remember when we read, we learned that we had to fully concede, we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. It said the delusion that we're like other people are presently made be has to be smashed. All right? In order to smash the delusion that we're not alcoholics, I'm going to ask each of you a simple question. Are you ready to concede to your innermost self that you're powerless over alcohol? In other words, are you an alcoholic? All that is required is a yes or no answer, and I'm just going to go around the table. If you're not convinced you're alcoholic or that your life is unmanageable, please let us know. Your sponsor or any one of us, um, we'll be willing to spend time with you this week to discuss your reservations. For those that are ready, let's take the first step together. Bill, do you concede to your innermost self that you are alcoholic? Okay. And you? Yes. Debbie? Yes. Okay. Congratulations. Everyone answered yes, and we have all taken the first step together. Okay. It's that simple. Now that we admit it, we're alcoholics, let's look at what we have to do in order to recover. Just in case we're not convinced that we need a power greater than ourselves, the authors of the big book wrote this statement on the last paragraph of chapter 3, more about alcoholism, and that's on page 43. From here on out, we're going to kind of breeze through the information. We're going to go through it rather rapidly, and we did start a few minutes late, so... We may run a couple minutes over 8 o'clock, so if you have to leave, uh, please feel free to do so, but hopefully you'll stick around, and we won't go that much over. Okay, uh, on the last paragraph of 43, it says, Once more, the alcoholic at certain times has no effective mental defense against the first drink, except in a few rare cases neither he nor any other human being can provide such a defense. His defense must come from a higher power. All right? Let's dispel the myth that's quite often heard in the meeting rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Many well-intentioned people make the statement, 
When I feel like drinking, I remember where I came from. I think to drink through and keep my memory green. Well, that's good advice, provided I have a mental defense against alcohol. The paragraphs we just read tell us that at certain times we don't have a mental defense against the first drink. That implies that sometimes I might. So sometimes I might be able to remember where I come from. Sometimes I might be able to think the drink through. Sometimes I might be able to keep my memory green. But the scary thing is sometimes I won't. The real scary thing is I don't know when that sometime will be. All right? So can you see how those neat little nifty things really aren't that effective? You know how at certain times I can't keep myself sober. Me, on my own power, I can't keep myself sober. And if I knew when I was going to have the mental defense, then I wouldn't be truly powerless over alcohol, would I? Right? So what this paragraph is telling us is that in order for me not to drink alcohol, I must have a power greater than myself. And that power, that power, not my power, that power will provide my defense and keep me safe and protected from alcohol. That's guaranteed, of course, if I follow certain steps. So since we admitted that we're powerless and we have a need to find the power, let's proceed to the second step, which is came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Chapter 4, We Agnostics, gives us a lot of information and direction for us to take step 2. Be sure to read this chapter in addition to the other chapters we covered during the next week. To give us the basis for taking the second step, we're going to cover four main points. One, do you believe or are you willing to believe that there is a power that will solve your problem? Two, do you have a conception of that power which makes sense and works for you? Three, is that power, which the book quite often refers to God, is that power everything? And if not, is it nothing? At this point, we'll have to make a choice. And the, the fourth thing is, where are we going to find this power? Right. So when, when you read through this chapter during the next week, try to look at those, those four uh, different points. And that's what we're going to target right now. Page 46, starting with the third line in the first paragraph. All right. uh, it says, it, it, it explains... Uh, it explains what I'm going to encapsulize right now. All right? Uh, we're, due to time, we're not going to read those paragraphs. But on pages 46 and 47, the book gives us certain requirements for the second step. In a nutshell, they tell us we have to lay aside prejudice. We have to express a willingness to believe. We have to come up with our own conception of God. We have to admit the possible existence of that power and we have to honestly seek that power. So if we met these requirements, let's look at the question on page 46 in the second paragraph. We needed to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe or am, or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? As soon as a man can say that he does believe or is willing to believe, we emphatically assure him that he is on his way. It has been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. There's a handout in front of you, and we can go, after, we can go over it after the meeting, or I'll, maybe I'll explain it next week, and it's entitled The Wonderfully Effective Spiritual Structure. All right? And that's what that paragraph talks about when it talks about the second step being our cornerstone. Okay? Let's see who's ready to proceed and take the first step. The first part of the first of uh, the second step. Well, uh, all right, I'm just going to again a- ask the question: uh, Do you now believe, or are you willing to believe that there is a power greater than yourself? Bill, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't know you. Juanita, okay. Debbie, yeah. great. Okay. Now we can move forward. If we don't have a conception of God that makes sense to us, pages 46 and 47 give us some good ideas. The following are some of the words and descriptions that the old-timers of this fellowship used to describe God. They called it a power greater than themselves, 
all-powerful, guiding, creative intelligence, spirit of the universe, realm of the spirit, supreme being, or simply power. Then later on in, in the chapter, they refer to it as the great reality, the presence of infinite power and love. Isn't that beautiful? Maker. You know, there's another book that refers to, to God as our maker. Now, that's a real big, big book. And of course, they refer to that power as being God. So let us keep in mind that these are only examples of terms found in this chapter to describe God. Feel free to use these or any other conception that you may have, provided it makes sense to you. Remember, use your own conception, however limited it may currently be. The important thing is, is that it's your conception and that it makes sense to you. Now that we have, uh, now that we believe we're, or are willing to believe, and we have our own conception of God, we have to consider the proposition that many people call the second step choice. It's on page 53 in the second paragraph. It says, When we became alcoholics, crushed by a self-imposed crisis, we could not postpone or evade. We had to fiercely face the proposition that either God is everything or else he is nothing. God either is or he isn't. What was our choice to be? Let's take a moment to consider both sides of the coin. If we believe what our book says, and we believe the experience of thousands of recovered alcoholics that have gone through this before us, we can easily answer this question in the affirmative. But let's consider for a moment that we choose God to be nothing in our lives. Maybe a scary proposition. And that he isn't a part of us. Where do we go from here? Well, if that be the case, we won't be able to go much further. And if we're really, truly powerless, we need God now more than ever. Okay? So, are we ready to proceed? Okay, I know I am. The last thing we need to look at in the second step is where do we find God? Well, we find our answer on page 55. And it says in the second paragraph, Actually, we were fooling ourselves. For deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It may be obscured, and obscured means to be hidden or blocked, all right, so the fundamental idea of God may be hidden by calamity, by pomp, or by, we'll find out in our four-step inventories, by resentments, fears, and the guilt, shame, and remorse of the harms we've caused others, or by worship of other things, but in some form or other it is there. For faith in a power greater than ourselves and the miraculous demonstrations of that power in human lives are facts as old as man himself. So, now we know where to find God. It's deep down within ourselves. At the end of the chapter, they tell a story of a man who had been relieved from his drink obsession and restored to sanity by the loving hand of God. The book says on page 57 in the first paragraph, it's right at the end of the chapter, it says, what is this but a miracle of healing? Yet its elements are, elements are simple. Circumstances, and this man's circumstances, of course, were step one, the pain, suffering, and humiliation of his drinking experiences. Those circumstances made him willing to believe, and he humbly offered himself to his maker. Then he knew. Sounds like this guy took the first three steps, right? He experienced the pain and suffering of active alcoholism. Those things made him willing to believe. And then he humbly offered himself to his maker. We'll find out in the third step prayer. It says, God, I offer myself to thee. Right? Even so has God restored us all to our right minds. To this man, the revelation was sudden. And this, revel this sudden revelation we're referring to as in a spiritual experience. And that's like Bill W. had in Towns Hospital. Some of us grow into it more slowly, and I think in this day and age more of us do, including myself. And that's the spiritual awakening, and that's described in Appendix 2. You know, we, we hear in AA, 
uh, the, the spiritual awakening uh, of the educational variety. And that's what most of us get today as a result of taking the steps. So he has come for all who have honestly sought him. When we draw near to him, and that him is God, he discloses himself to us. So we've completed the first two steps in the program recovery. In order for God to disclose himself to us, we have to draw near to him. That means we have to move forward to step three. Step three reads, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Let's clarify a couple words that confuse some of us and certainly confused me in the third step. First, the word decision. The word decision implies that action will follow. I'm sure we're all familiar with the story of the three frogs on the log. One frog decides to jump off at a log. How many frogs are left? Three, right? Okay. So we all know how to make a decision. Good. (laughs) The one frog only decided to jump. He didn't take any action. Secondly, let's look at the words, our will and our lives. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. I never knew what those were. I never knew what my will or my life was. You know? What is my will, and how can we turn our lives over to something? Well, my will is nothing more than my thinking, and my life is an accumulation of my actions up until this point. You know, my life is my past, present, and future. Let's reread the step using these new words. I'm not trying to rewrite the big book, but this, this helped me to, to understand this step a little bit more. We're going to decide to turn our thoughts and our actions over to God as we understand Him. That's a little bit easier now, right? Let's begin the reading of step three on page 60 after the ABCs. Let's go to page 60 in chapter five. And after the ABCs, it says, being convinced we're at step three, which is that we decided to turn our will, which is our thinking, and our lives, which is our actions, over to God as we understood Him. Just what do we do and what do we do and what do we mean by that? Well, there are more requirements to be met. Be sure to read pages 60 through 62 during the next week. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to read them together now. Basically, the book tells us the requirements of the third step are the following. I have to be convinced that my life run on my own self-will can hardly be a success. Okay, that's the first requirement. Second one is I have to quit trying to, I have to quit trying to run my life on my own self-will. I have to quit playing God. Why? Right. Me trying to play God doesn't work. And the third one is, I have to let God be God. And I have to let Him run my life. Now we're ready to make our third step decision together. In the next paragraph, they tell us what our decision is to be. It says, this is the how and the why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Next, we decided that hereafter, in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. He is the principal. We are his agents. He is the father. We are his children. Most good ideas are simple, and this concept was the keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which we pass to freedom. Again, you can refer to this sheet here. And here's the keystone way at the top which is going to hold all the other stones in the place in our spiritual structure. Okay? So what this decision means is that first we have to quit playing God. We're going to decide that God is going to direct us. We're going to decide that God is the boss and we're his employees. Right? When I go to work, do I tell my boss what I want to do? No. No. My boss tells and shows me what to do. Well, sometimes if you're an alcoholic running on self-will, you'll tell the boss what to do, but we try not to do that today. And the third thing is we decide that 
God is the Father and we're his kids. Have we have we all made this decision again? Is this all what we want to do? Debbie? Sure? Okay. All right. As a result of just making this decision, the book tells us we will receive several promises. They're listed in the first paragraph of page 63. It says, when we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. And when we read through these promises, why wouldn't we want to make this decision? Look at what we're going to get here. We had a new employer. Being all-powerful, he provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. More and more, we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. As we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered we could face life successfully, as we became conscious of his presence, we began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, or the hereafter. We were reborn. All right, so let's affirm the decision we just made by saying the third step prayer uh, that's in the next paragraph together as a group. All right. Uh, it's on page 63 in the middle of the page, and also there's some cards that should be in front of you uh, in case you don't know it by heart. So let's say the prayer, which is nothing more than an affirmation of the decision we just made together. Many of us said to our Maker as we understood Him, God, I offer myself to Thee to build with me and to do with me as Thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help, of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Book says, we thought well before taking the step, making sure we were ready, that we could at last abandon ourselves utterly to him. So the next thing we have to do is launch out on a course of vigorous action, the first step of which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us have never attempted. So our decision, which is the third step, was a vital and crucial step. It could have little permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking us. Our liquor was but a symptom, so we had to get down the causes and conditions. That ends today's session. Next week, we'll learn how to do the four-step inventory, and we will begin it in class. It's not as difficult as some of the things you may have heard shared in meetings. My experience is, is that we can have fun with inventory and learn to laugh at ourselves, but see the truth about how we are running our own lives, provided we take inventory the way the big book tells us. We'll also cover the directions for step five, and we'll prepare to complete these two steps before we meet for the third week. Please review what we've covered during the past hour and ask someone who's gone through the work before if you have any questions during the next week. Remember, you can put your name on the phone list and it will be available for the next week so we can begin to call and support each other during our journey through the 12th step. Are there any questions on what we've covered so far? First paragraph. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, some sometimes people receive these promises uh, right after they make the decision. You know, like a sudden revelation type of thing. Okay. So remember what our reading assignments are for the next week. Review the doctor's opinion. The first four chapters. And Appendix 2, The Spiritual Experience. Read the third step from Chapter 5 and familiarize yourself with the information and directions for Step 4 in Chapter 5. And it would be nice if we all began to, to say the third step prayer on a daily, break, on a daily basis. You know, if, if, uh, if uh, we, 
we can include this in, in our morning meditation, and if you like, say it throughout the day and, and uh, at nighttime before we uh, put our heads on the pillow. All right. So, uh, if there's no questions, I'd like to uh, thank those that did come this morning, and uh, may God bless each and every one of you. And we have a nice way of closing. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mike, and I am an alcoholic. Before we begin, let's have a moment of quiet time to invite the God of our own understanding into our hearts and ask for an open mind and the willingness to have a new experience, of course, followed by the serenity prayer. Serenity prayer. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, courage to change the things we can, and wisdom to know the difference. Thy will not mine be done. Okay, as we get a couple other people coming in this morning. Um, <laughs> Good morning. So basically what we did, guys, is uh, we just opened up and we took a moment of quiet time and we said the serenity prayer. And uh, as we know, as a group, we're taking the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and four one-hour classes as they were taking in the, in the mid-1940s. Uh, during this session, we will begin step four and provide you with guidelines for completing your inventory. During the next week, each person taking the step should discuss his or her inventory with a sponsor or a spiritual advisor. Uh, before we begin, uh, Debbie and Juanita, if you would, just look on the back table there and pick up one of the, the booklets with the red cover because we're going to use that for this session. So last week, we took the first three steps together in class. Uh, is there anyone here this morning that didn't have the opportunity to take the first three steps last week? We all did that together? All right. Okay. And we agreed upon that basically the third step is nothing more than a decision to turn our thinking and our actions over to the care of God as we understand them, and we also decided to go through with the remaining steps of the program of recovery. Okay, so what I'd like to do to open up this meeting before we get into the, third, into the fourth step, uh, let's just say the third step prayer together to uh, reaffirm the decision that we made last week in step three. Uh, it's on page 63 in the book, or if you See one of the cards in front of you. You can read it from there if you need to. Third step prayer. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Okay, now we can move on to the fourth step. Step four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. If we'd all turn to uh, the bottom of page 63 in the big book, it tells us that what we need to do now that we've made our decision on the bottom of 63, tells us what we have to do. It says, next we launched out on a course of vigorous action, the first step of which is a personal house cleaning. And what they're talking about is the first step in the personal house cleaning, which, of course, we all know is step four. Okay, so the fourth step is going to be the first step in our personal house cleaning. And the book tells us, this is something that many of us had never attempted. Again, this is on the, uh, now we're at the top of page 64 in the big book. It says, though our decision, which is step three, was a vital and crucial step, it could have little permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and to be rid of the things in ourselves which had been blocking us. All right? We discovered last week in the third step that some of those things are calamity, pomp, resentments, fears, 
fear, guilt, shame, or remorse from our conduct. Okay, those are all the things that are blocking us. Basically, that's our character defects and our shortcomings. It says our liquor was, was but a symptom. So we had to get down the causes and conditions. Now let's remember that the book said we do this at once. Okay? It didn't say we take step three and we wait a year. It says upon doing the third step, we, we take step four at once. This means we take the fourth step inventory immediately after step three. We have, we have to get rid of those things which have been blocking us off from God or else our initial contact with our creator won't last. And we found that initial contact last week in step three. So what are these causes and conditions that the big book talks about? Well, the book uses a lot of different words meaning the same things. It says damaged or unsalable goods, flaws in our makeup, defects of character, shortcomings, and it even uses the word wrongs. All these things have the same effect. They block us off from God. The book starts the fourth step by comparing a personal inventory to a, per, to a business inventory. In the first full paragraph of page 64, the book says, Therefore, we started upon a personal inventory. This was step four. A business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. Taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding and a fact-facing process. It is an effort to discover the truth about the stock and trade. One object is to disclose damaged or unsellable goods, to get rid of them promptly and without regret. If the owner of the business is to be successful, he cannot fool himself about values. So we're going to conduct the equivalent of a commercial inventory on our lives. We're going to discover what had blocked us off from the sunlight of the spirit. Next, the big book tells us exactly what we have to do to conduct the four-step inventory says we did the same thing with our lives. We took stock honestly. First, we searched out the flaws in our makeup, which had caused our failure. Being convinced that self manifested in various ways was what had defeated us, we considered its common manifestations. We're going to inventory or take stock of, if you will, three manifestations of self-will. Our resentments, fears, and our conduct with emphasis on sex. We have provided a guide booklet for you, and if you just walked in, you can get one of the guide booklets with a red cover on it by the table back there. And that booklet covers steps four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, and we're going to be using it for the next two or three weeks. We're going to read the clear-cut, simple directions that the big book documents for us and use the guide booklet in conjunction to help us start and complete our inventories. We're going to take the fourth step exactly the way the big book prescribes. Let us reassure you the fourth step is not difficult, nor should it be a tedious process. Within seven pages of text, the big book gives us precise instructions on how to make a good beginning on facing and getting rid of the obstacles in our path. Now, the first manifestation of self we're going to look at is our resentments. In the third paragraph on page 64, the book says, Resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From it stem all forms of spiritual disease. For we have not only, we have not been only mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick. Now here's the great hope. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. All right. So for a physical and mental problem, the book is going to give us a spiritual solution. Resentment basically means to refeel or feel again. The little big book dictionary, which can be found on the back table back there, gives us the following definition for resentment. It says, a persistent feeling of ill will and suppressed anger caused by a sense of injustice, injury, offense, or wrong done. And it's to resent. To resent basically means to feel again strongly or to relive again. Okay? Anyone that's heard the Joe and Charlie tapes, they talk about that resentment replay machine, that tape in my head that replays the 
past events of, of uh, people injuring me, whether it was fancy or real, uh, those things, that tape that just plays over and over in my head. Let's first look at the simple step-by-step, column-by-column procedure the big book gives us for writing the resentment inventory. Six lines from the bottom of page 64, the book tells us, in dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. We listed people, institutions, or principles with whom we were angry. So on page two of our guide booklet, it gives us some examples of the resent- it gives us an example of the resentment in- inventory, and it's the same example that's found on page 65 uh, of the big book. Let's look at page three of our guide, which lists examples of people institutions, and principles that alcoholics are commonly resentful at. Okay? Is everyone there? Page three of the guide. To help us get a start with the first column of our resentment inventory, we're going to go down the list of names on this checklist. Generally, alcoholics know exactly who they're resentful towards. Unless you have a deep-seated resentment, the names on this list should help you list the people, institutions, and principles that need to be listed in your first column. Okay, so we're going to do a four-column resentment inventory. This is the first column. Once we've checked off the names on this list, we're going to transfer them over to the four-column inventory sheet that is on pages four and five of the guide. As I read through the list of names, check the ones with whom you're resentful towards, angry with, or feel any ill will towards. All right. Uh, pages four and five of the guide are, are to be used in class, and uh, pages six and seven are the same thing, except it doesn't have that little box in the upper left-hand corner. And what you can do with the guide, is pages six and seven is the, uh, the four-column resentment inventory sheet. You, you take the guide booklet like this and just run it over a photocopier, and you make additional sheets. If you don't have access to a photocopier, there's a few additional copies on the table back there. All right. What I would ask you to do is, if you do have access to a photocopier, please make them from from these sheets. Uh, don't take the ones back there. Let the people that don't have access use the sheets back there, if you want to use the sheets at all. You know, it's not a requirement that, that you have to uh, use this format. Some people just uh, like to use a notebook, all right? But for me, it was important that I have some sort of structure, and uh, these proved quite helpful for me. So let's begin with the names listed under the category people, okay? Are we all there? All righty. So as I read through these names, what I like for all of us to do is just check off the ones that, that apply to us that we're resentful towards, have any anger towards or any ill will, all right? Usually I go to, people will ask me, well, how about if I'm not sure if I have a resentment against this person? And I usually go by the basis of if they're in your head and if you're asking that question, write it down just in case. I'd rather take a couple minutes of writing on paper just to run it through the four-column process just to make sure rather than have this resentment in my head and killing me later on, all right? So when in doubt, write it out. So we're going to read through here, and if it applies, just check it off, and we'll transfer the names over later. Okay. Father or stepfather, mother or stepmother, sisters or stepsisters, brothers or stepbrothers, grandmother Grandfather, in-laws, husbands, wives, aunts, uncle, am I going too fast? Cousins, clergy. That's priests, rabbis, ministers, guys that wear those funny little white collars. Police. I want to see pen to paper now. 
lawyers, judges, doctors, employers, employees, co-workers, creditors, that's people we owe money to, of course, childhood friends, and if you could remember a specific friend, just kind of jot down the name next to it, school friends, teachers, like the one that gave you an F on the exam, lifelong friends, best friends, acquaintances, girlfriends, boyfriends, parole officers, probation officers, AA friends, imagine that, and maybe military friends. I had a couple of those. And you'll notice uh, there's also a few lines. And if you want to take a couple minutes to uh, just ask yourself if there's any more people that need to go on this list, and you can jot them down. Okay, now we're going to go through a few institutions. How about the institution of marriage? The Bible? Church? Religion, races, law, authority, government, the educational system, the correctional system, <laughs> mental health system, any philosophies or uh, people of different uh, nationalities. And also, which is not on uh, not on your list, but it, uh, I know a lot of alcoholics have, especially ones that, that have been around a while in and out of AA, uh, have out rehabs or hospitals. Okay, you can just kind of write those in. Okay, and of course, write any additional ones that you have that aren't on the list. Please don't limit yourself to this list. That's not what the list is for. Okay, principles. The God deity. The principle of retribution. The Ten Commandments. Jesus Christ. Satan. Death. Life after death. Heaven. Hell, sin, adultery, the golden rule, you know, doing to others as you would have them doing to you. When I first came to AA, I used to say, do it to others before they do it to me. Or the seven deadly sins, which of course the 12 and 12 goes in the great depth about. And again, list any other ones that aren't on here. Yeah, any of these principles or any other ones that you resent. Like another example of a principle is love thy neighbor. Different man-made laws, you may not have any. I tell you, when my first inventory, when I first, when I first got sober, I didn't have any principles on my list because I didn't have any principles. I mean, that's just the way it was for me. Okay, move forward. Great, the first column of our resentment inventory is complete. And if it's not, you can review it later, later on and through the week and add anything additional. What we're going to do now is transfer a couple names we just checked off to the first column of the inventory sheet on pages four and five of the guide booklet. All right. This sheet is a sample for us to use in class. Please use the sheets on page six and seven to make additional copies for yourselves during the next week. Now let's take a couple of moments to jot down the two biggest resentments we have. 
Transfer the names from your inventory prompt, your resentment inventory prompt sheet on page three of the guide to the first column, which is on resentful at on page four. Okay, what we're going to do is a couple examples on the on the board, uh, but let's first go over the directions for columns two, three, and four. All right. Follow along on pages 64 and 65 of the big book, and at the same time, follow along on pages 4 and 5 of the guide booklet. Okay, the second column, which is in, in your guide booklet, is entitled The Cause, and it's the second in instruction is three lines up from the bottom of page 64. It says, we asked ourselves why, we're, why we were angry. All right, so I'll take a look at my first column. And if I have uh, Pete and Harry in the first column, I'm going to ask myself, why am I burned up or sore at Pete and Harry? All right? What did they do to make me angry? That's what, that's what I'm going to write in my second column. In the second column, it's what they did to me that caused me to be angry or resentful to them. All right? I'm resentful at Pete. He punched me in the face. The second column is he, he punched me in the face. So list all the resentments you have for each name. And remember, you can have more than one resentment towards a person. You know, maybe Pete punched me in the face, he slept with my wife, and took all my money. That's three separate resentments. Right. And they can just be brief bullets. In the third column, which is entitled Effects Mind, the third instruction on page 64, the last three lines, and page 65, the first two lines, and we're going to be looking at seven areas of self. Okay, it says, in most cases, it was found that our self-esteem, that's the first area of self, our pocketbooks, that's the second, that's our money, our ambitions, that's the third. Our plans for the future. Our personal relationships, that's the fourth. Including sex, that's five. Or hurt or threatened. In the first paragraph on page 65, the big book repeats itself. It says, on our grudge list, we set opposite each name our injuries. Was it our self-esteem? We already have that one. Our security, that's a new one, that's six. All right, on, on the guide sheet it says emotional security. Our ambitions, our personal or sex relations which had been interfered with. And from the lower right hand corner of page 65 in Bill's resentment inventory example, we get the word pride. That's the seventh area of self. Okay, so that's the seven areas of self that are affected by resentments according to the big book. Remember, our self-esteem is how we view ourselves. Pride is how we think others think about us. And our ambitions are our plans for the future. Our emotional security is our general sense of personal well-being. Right? Basically, that means, am I okay? So when the first three columns are complete, the big book tells us to pray for the people we resent. Well, why would we want to pray for these people? We need to rid ourselves of these resentments. Well, why on earth would we want to be free of resentment? Shouldn't we justifiably be angry with these people? Don't we have a right to be burned up? Well, let's see what the book says on the middle of page 66. Okay, again, with that third column, just put a check mark. If what they did to you affects a specific area of self, just check it off. Okay? So on page 66, it, the book says, it's, it is plain that a life which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. To the precise extent that we permit these, do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile. But with the alcoholic, whose hope is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience, this business of resentment is infinitely grave. We found that it is fatal, right? So resentments are going to kill us. For when harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit. The insanity of alcohol, 
right? The obsession of the mind, the insanity of alcohol returns and we drink again, and with us to drink is to die. Well, that's very simple, isn't it? The book says very clearly if we continue to hold on to resentments, we will drink again. How do we get free of anger, as the book suggests we do? The next couple of paragraphs deal with a prayer. First, the big book asks us to turn back to our list because it holds the key to our future. Then they tell us to look at it from an entirely different angle. On the bottom of page 66, the book says, this was our course. We realized that the people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick. So we did not like their symptoms and the way these disturb, disturbed us, right? That's the second column. They, like ourselves, were sick too. The next few lines are prayers to rid our resentment. This will make more sense when we do it on the board. Right? This is a prayer found on the top of page 67. We ask God to help us show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience that we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. When a person offended, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man, how can I be helpful to him? Right? We're asking God how we can be helpful to the people we resent. That's a miracle within itself. It says, God, save me from being angry, thy will be done. That's a prayer that I try to use on a daily basis when resentment or anger occurs in my daily life. Okay? Let's do some examples on the board of the first three columns, and then we'll do the fourth later. So first, we're, uh, remember, when you do inventory, it's from top to bottom. You do all the, can everyone see this? You do all the first column first, like we did with the names, okay? And you're just going to list the names from top to bottom. Don't go from left to right. You can try that, but it's my experience. If I try to do inventory from left to right, I'm going to get confused, okay? But if I stick to one column at a time from top to bottom, I find it's helpful because I... My mind, my thought patterns can only see one thing at a time, okay? So, uh, would somebody like to share one, one of, one of the people or institutions or principles? One of the names that you have in your first column that you're resentful at. Juanita, would you like to, uh, throw one of yours up there? And we'll put it on the board. Okay. I got one more. Anybody else want to do one? Steve, Bill, you got one you want to do? Father, okay. Debbie, you got one you want to run through here? Okay. Okay, so we have a list of our names. All right, so now we're going to go to the second column, which is the cause. I'm resentful at my aunt. She won't come to my wedding, okay? Juanita, why are you resentful at your mother? Okay. Now, throughout the past few years of of doing inventory and... and, uh, I've done, I'm currently on my, my fourth resentment inventory. I, I've just found it necessary to do this process over and over again, and I like to stay current in it. Uh, the more and more I do this work, the more and more I, I see it necessary to find truth in the second column, okay? Uh, in the second column, I've learned to try to stay away from statements like, I never, all right, things like that. So... What I would ask you is, is that the truth? She never showed love to you? Never, ever? Or were there some times she didn't show love to me? Okay, most times. All right. See, it's important that that we write down the truth in the second column.
Because if we don't, the rest of the inventory is going to be a lie. Okay? If I'm writing the second and the fourth column based on a lie, or the third and the fourth column based on a lie, what's that third and fourth column going to be? A lie, right? Okay. So we want to see truth. Steve, your father. Why are you resentful towards your father? Okay. Okay. I'm going to put down didn't reach out. And I'm sure if you thought about it, you can narrow that down a little bit more, get a little more specific. What we try to do in the second column is look for specific instances, like you mentioned about the school and stuff. You know, he didn't help me with my schoolwork, stuff like that, maybe. All right? Debbie, Eric, why are you what do you have in the second column for Eric? Okay. I love left me. I really love left me. All right? Because what I found out, I had a couple left me. And, uh, well, I'll tell you that when we get to the fourth column. All right? Now we go to the third column. We do first column, top to bottom. Second column, top to bottom. And when all the first and second columns are finished, we go to the third column. And we're going to do each third column from top to bottom, too, okay? Uh, some people like to to write down in the third column uh, exactly how the seven areas of self were affected, all right? But I, I found it helpful for me as a beginner and other people going through this for the first time. We like to just do a check mark, okay? But we can verbalize it in the words as we go through it. So I found out with my aunt, by her not coming to the wedding, it affects my self-esteem, all right? And what the committee in my head tells me when my self-esteem is affected is that nobody should treat me that way. I'm better than that. Remember, self-esteem is how I view myself, what I think about me, all right? I'm better than that. Nobody should treat me that way. Nobody should abandon me, all right? So, Juanita, your mother... So most times she didn't show attention to, to you. Does that affect your self-esteem, how, how you think of yourself? Okay. By your mother not showing attention to you, does that make you feel any le less or more of yourself? All right, so it affects your self-esteem. Okay. And just for a little check mark. Okay, um, father, by your father not reaching out, does that affect your self-esteem? Sure. And by Eric leaving you, Debbie, did that affect your self Of course, okay. I'm saying of course like it's by everybody. <laughs> All right, so now emotional security. Remember, security is uh, my general sense of well-being about myself. All right, and of course by my aunt not coming to my wedding, it most definitely affects my emotional security, all right? I'm not feeling too good about myself. She doesn't love me. She doesn't care uh, about the woman that I'm going to marry. Emotional security is my general sense of well-being, all right? Basically, how I can see if my emotional security is affected, I ask myself the question, am I okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Your mother, emotional security. Okay. Father? Yeah. Eric? Okay, and what's next thing is pocketbook, which is our money. Now, by my aunt not coming to the wedding, do you think that would affect my pocketbook? Regardless of what I have written on the board. There you go. See, that's that's where my alcoholic mind goes, right? But I want to deny that because I'm the spiritual man. I'm the spiritual man that doesn't think I need to have 
anyone give me money. You know, a couple of years ago, I probably would have said no to that. You know, but that that's definitely a yes. Mom. Okay. Pops. Okay. All right. So we'll leave it blank for now. Okay. Eric. All right. My ambitions, my plans for the future. By my aunt not coming to my wedding, does that affect my ambitions? I certainly think so. It affects my relationship with my aunt in the future. All right. It affects that any plans I might have had for her and, and uh, of course, my, my grandmother. If my aunt doesn't go, my grandmother can't go because she's 92 years old. All right. So I had that check. Mother, ambitions. All right. Father, plans for the future? Yep. Yeah. Eric. Yeah. Personal relationships. Absolutely for me. Huh? Yeah. Does that affect how you interact with either the person you resent or any other person in your life? Okay. We know what mom? Okay. Father? Eric? Sex relations with my aunt? I'm leaving that blank because I don't want to get too far into it. But I tell you how I could say yes. If I have resentment against my aunt, it could very well affect my, self, my, my sex relations with my partner. If I'm not feeling too good about the situation, if I'm not feeling too good about myself, I may not, if my partner wants to get intimate with me, I may not much want to feel like having sex. All right? But that, that, that hasn't happened yet. All right? So I'm going to leave that blank. What's that, that? Right. Mother. Okay. That, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Father. Okay. All right. Eric. <laughs> and the last one. Pride. It's how I see, how, how I think other people view me. All right. My aunt, definitely. Your mother. Father. Okay. And Eric. All right. So with, with the exception of uh, Steve's father in the pocketbook area, we're a wipeout, right? All seven areas of our lives are affected. We're in great danger here, all right? Yeah. All seven areas of our life are affected. If we don't do something about this, we're going to die. You know, this is the tragedy, tragedy of the ego, you know? These things in my head are, are telling me that, that I'm really affected like this. Remember, the book says these resentments, fancied or real, have to be mastered or else we're going to drink and die. Okay. Now we're going to look. And, and remember, after we do the first three columns, we got to pray for these people. And we got to say that prayer on the top of page 67. Well, as you go through your inventory, all right? And you may not be able to do it right away, but if you're... For me, it's important to have the willingness to do it. Oh, absolutely. Because the prayers aren't for them. The prayers are for me. No. no. I got a question real quick. Sure. These uh, principles are done the same way? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Let's look at the fourth column now. We're going to read the directions for the fourth column. It's on page 67. Referring to our list again, putting out of our minds the wrongs others have done, we resolutely look for our own mistakes. All right. We're going to focus on these words. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, or afraid? All right. Those four things we're going to key on. 
Actually, the book says frightened. Though the situation had not been entirely our fault, we tried to disregard the other person involved entirely. All right? Try to put out of your head the, the harms that they thought did, did to us. Let's look at what we did. And what did we do to get the ball rolling? Where were we to blame? The inventory was ours, not the other man's. When we saw our faults, we listed them. We placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our wrongs honestly and were willing to set these matters straight. Okay. All right. So let's just go through the examples on the board. And remember, let's look at this deal from an entirely different angle. And let's see what we did. So with my aunt, I, I had to take a look at where was I selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened. You know? And uh, when we do this on the board, I'm just basically going to write down which area, what I did, keying on those four words. But when I write out inventory in the fourth column, I write out exactly where I had been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, or frightened. I, I write out the short sentence of actually what I did because the book says, what did I do? Where was I to blame? You know, what what were my wrongs? Okay. So in my aunt, where am I selfish in this? Where am I selfish in this deal? Well, what, what I found out is I'm selfish because I expect her to do what I wanted to do. I think, see, this is what my, my mind tells me. This is what my ego tells me in the third column. Family should always be there, right? Isn't that selfish of me? Think I know what other people should do, right? So I'm definitely selfish in that one. And again, let's do this from top to bottom when we when we do uh, when we complete this in the next week. But for now, we're just going to do all areas of, of self, all right, due to time constraints. Now, where am I dishonest? tell you exactly where I was dishonest. When I first found out she wasn't coming to the wedding, I thought this didn't affect me. See, this is this is that different this isn't about cash cash register honesty. It's about me denying that it didn't affect me. Right? Yeah, I lied to myself. In this case it is. Right? In some cases I may have stolen from someone that I resent it. You know, that would be the obvious type of honesty. But I didn't think that her, by her not coming, I didn't think this affected me and I denied it for a long time until I woke up one morning and instead of thinking of God the first thing when I opened my eyes, I thought about resenting her. It was scary. All right? Self-seeking. I want what I want when I want it. I want her to do what I want her to do. I'm like the actor in the third step. If people would only do as I want it, the show would come off great. The truth is, I don't know, I don't need her to be at my wedding to be okay. I don't need that. Where am I, where am I frightened? I'm afraid she won't come. I'm really afraid that because of me going through with my plans, that the entire family won't ever, that they'll abandon me. That's what I'm really afraid of. All right. Okay, mother. Selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, or frightened. Selfish. Okay. Dishonest. Well, I put mother should also child because that's the beginning of the day. Right. That mother's not all because of that being selfish. Right. Okay, and denial, um, taking the bond into the country. Um, you know, my mother and my father, and I was feeling like, can I get mother? And I was denying myself of my feelings. Right. See, that's what my ego tells me in the third column, that my mom should always be there for me. All right. Why? <laughs> didn't have to be. That's why I'm selfish. Okay, self-seeking. 
Self-seeking is me take, taking me, usually selfish is not doing something, excuse me, not doing something, all right? And self-seeking is the act of doing something to get what I want. <laughs> okay. Frightened? And I'm just going to circle the fears because we're going to take them, transfer them over into our fear inventory later because that's what the book tells us to do. Okay, Father. Were you dishonest? Okay. Self-seeking. Okay. Any fear there? Okay. Okay, with Eric. Selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, or frightened? Ah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay? We all see the exact nature. See, when the book says the exact nature of our wrongs, this is the exact nature. You know, we can write out exactly what we did. That's the wrong. That's what we did. But see, the book wants us to get down the causes and conditions. The exact nature of our wrongs. Selfish, self-seeking, dishonest, or afraid. Okay. Any questions on our resentment in regard? Simple enough? Okay. I think that the uh, the old timers in this program, the, the founders, never meant for this to be a long, arduous process. You know, as a matter of fact, in the way I'm bringing people through the fourth and fifth step today is, if the guy or gal couldn't write, and a lot of drunks back then just couldn't read or write, the sponsor would do the writing for them. You know, kind of like what we did here today. The sponsor would ask a series of questions and would write down. Because we're going to find out for our eighth and ninth step, we're going to need this information written down when we prepare to make amends. Okay. All right. Let's look at our fears now. On the last paragraph of page 67, the book says, Notice that the word fear is bracketed alongside the difficulties with Mr. Brown, Mrs. Jones, the employer, and the wife. Notice that up on the board, fear is circled in our fourth column, okay, for all four resentments. This short word, fear, somehow touches about every aspect of our lives. Get this now, it was the evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. Fear set in motion trains of circumstances which brought us misfortune we felt we didn't deserve. But it asks us a question. It says, but did not we ourselves set the ball rolling? All right, that's something to really consider. On the top of page 68, the big book tells us that fear ought to be classed with stealing. She seems to cause more trouble. All right. Something my sponsor taught me was that fear is a thief. It robs me from my relationship with God. All right. If I have fear, I don't have faith. How can I have faith in God if I have fear in areas of my life? All right. So here are the simple instructions for the fear inventory. First paragraph on page 68 says we reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, even though we had no resentment in connection with them. We asked ourselves why we had them. Okay. Two column fear inventory. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Self-reliance was good as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough. Some of us had once had great self-confidence, but it didn't fully solve the fear problem or any other. When it made us cocky, it was worse. Let's look at our fear inventory prompt sheet on page 8 of our guidebook. 
Now, when you complete the fear inventory during the next week, take all the fears from the fourth column of your resentment inventory, like we did here. See all the fears that we have circled? All right. Take all those fears and transfer them into the first column of the fear inventory on page 10, all right, which is what we're going to be, again, make copies of this page. Or if you don't have access to a copier, there's sheets on the back table there. Okay. Of what the fear is. Okay? So, like with my aunt, the fear would be fear of not being accepted. Okay? Right? With Eric, what would your fear be there? Fear of not being loved. Yeah. Right, fear of being alone. Hey, that was a biggie. That's a biggie for me. You know? I need people in my life. Right, we're going to get to that. That's the second column. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you might have, like, fears what you hear, but might not be correctly Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And the book tells us that. We listed our fears even though we had no... Uh, resentment and connection with them. Okay. So what we do is transfer any fears that you have from your resentment inventory, put them in the first column. Then during the next week, when you're all done with your resentment inventory, go through this fear prop sheet and see if you have any of these fears listed. All right. And then sit with that and see if any additional ones come to mind. And you don't even really have to use this this prompt sheet if you don't choose to. If you can clearly see them in your head, just write them down. But I found these prompt sheets very useful. Because I found out that the person that I lie most to is myself. And that will kill me today. All right. Any questions on the fear inventory? All right. First column is I'm fearful of. The second column is, why do I have that fear? All right. Without doing one on the board, uh, you know, again, uh, um, it would look something like this. I'm afraid, I'm afraid of being alone. Why do I have that fear? It hurts. Nobody will care for me. I could drink. I'll die. You know, like that. Any questions on that? Okay. So the book tells us that we have to get rid of fear. So how do we get rid of these fears? We found out in the resentment inventory that the way we rid resentments is through prayer. How do you think we're going to get rid of fears? Bill. Prayer. Okay. So it says on page 68, paragraph 3, six line, says, We never apologize for God. Instead, we let him dem- demonstrate through us what he can do. We ask him, we ask God to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. That's just a simple prayer. What I do with my fear inventory, I go down the list of fears. And I say, dear God, please remove my fear of heights and direct my attention towards what you would have me be. Dear God, please remove my fear of being abandoned and direct my attention towards what you would have me be. Okay? The results are in the next sentence. The results of that prayer are, at once we commence to outgrow fear. Notice the book doesn't say fear goes away and never comes back again. It states that we outgrow our fear. We outgrow fear because through prayer we're asking God to direct us towards his will. If I'm doing God's will, chances are I'm not going to have any fear. What do we say in AA? Do the right things and the right things will happen. If I'm doing God's will, I'm not doing Mikey's will. Chances are the right things are going to happen. I'm not going to have the fear. Okay. Any questions on that? 
Ready to do sex? <laughs> Please. <laughs> Find that. We'll, we'll read in just a minute that many of us have sex problems. <laughs> For me, that's not one of them. Okay. Now about sex. The big book continues on the bottom of page 68. They suggest many of us needed an overhauling in this area of our lives. They say on page 69 that we all have sex problems and we hardly be human if we didn't. The question is, what can we do without them? Well, the big book tells us to review our own conduct over the past years. Therefore, we begin our third and final inventory. Okay? Let's turn to page 11 of our guide. Starts on 68, and it goes all the way through to page 70. But see, they were smart when they took the doctor's opinion off of page 1 and put it in the Roman numerals, because on page 69 it talks about sex. So for alcoholics, we can remember page 69. Okay. <laughs> I'll speak to you after the meeting, though. <laughs> Okay. We're on page 11 of the guide. What we're going to do is begin to list all the people that we've had relations with over the past year. Usually relations of the opposite sex. Not necessarily the act of. Alright. Alright. And if you want to do it female, female, or if you're a guy, you want to do it male, male. You might be able to find some interesting truth in that, too. What I do with this is, and it says we went through our lives. All right? That's why we do it this way. I say a prayer, and I say, Dear God, please reveal to me any names that need to go in this conduct inventory. You know? And I begin when I was a little child, when I was five years old, the little girl in her backyard underneath the picnic table, you know, doctor, play doctor. You know, didn't know any better, just a little kid. You know? Okay. So once we listed all the names, let's look on page 11, then put a check mark in column 2 if you harm these people through your sex conduct. All right? So if, if you harm them through sex, you check that off. If you harm them in another way, excluding sex, Check off the second box. And if you didn't, if you had relations with these people and you didn't harm them at all, it's a miracle. No, you just put that. You just check it off. All right? Because there may be some people that I had relations with that I didn't harm. Few and far be in between, but okay. And any checks that we have in the first two columns, we're going to transfer over to the conduct inventory. And this is helpful for us later on because the book's going to tell us in the eighth step, we already have a list of people that we harmed and whom we all amends. All right? We made it when we took inventory, and this is where we make it. Also, what we can do is if there's any people that we found we harmed in our resentment inventory, like in the fourth column, we can tell that, right? If there was something specific that we did to harm them, we transfer that over to the conduct inventory. See, the conduct inventory isn't just about sex. It's about our conduct. Right. It's with emphasis on sex. And what if you told somebody that time that we've Sure, write it down. That would come other, in, in page 11 of the guide, it would come under harmed in another way. Okay. And the reason we do it this way is because a lot of people, see, at one time, the way I used to do the conduct inventory was only emphasis on sex. And people would say, well, what happens if I harm somebody and, and, and it had nothing to do with sex? So then we came out with a force sheet that said harms excluding sex. Right? But in reality, this is really the same thing. It's a conduct inventory with emphasis on sex. Yeah, you'll find that uh, right in the inventory. It's a four-column inventory similar to, to resentment. Okay. <laughs> All right, so in column one, we list people we've hurt. And again, let's look on 11 and 12. We're not going to write anything on pages 11 and 12 because you're going to use these to make your copies during the next week. Okay? 
column two, list, list what you did to, to hurt the person in column one. Right. Also list where you were at fault, where you had been selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate. In column three, list if you unjustifiably, which is an interesting word, allows jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness. Okay. Bill asked that question before. By me doing such and such to so and so, did, did I make that person or any other person jealous, suspicious, or cause any bitterness? It says we affect people all around our lives, not just the not just the one person that we have listed. Other people can be affected too. Okay. So then in the fourth column, which is basically our solution column, and this is going to help us with our ideal for the future, says, what should we have done instead? Usually, what should we have done instead? Usually, what I should have done instead is the opposite of what I did. Okay? I hurt somebody through sex. What should I have done instead? I shouldn't have done that. I robbed somebody. What should I have done? What should I have done instead? I shouldn't have done that. You know? I should have been a giver than a taker. Juanita, do you have a question? Yeah, because, um, and that, I remember when I did my fourth step, I was like, I was like, oh, that was the same. Mm hmm. Because most of my relationships, I figured out that I pushed myself into them. Now, if you're. Right. Because I didn't have any relationship, I did. See, if you want to get a, if you've taken inventory before and you want to get a deeper look into this, you could expand on that a little bit more. You know, me being six years sober, when, when I do the nightly review and I come across that question before I go to sleep, it says, what could I have done instead? You know? It's not always about, well, I could have did the opposite. It's about, I could have been a little more kind, loving, tolerant, patient, you know. I could have done something different. So think about that. You know, kind of sit with that. Alrighty. So, uh, please be sure to review the bottom of page 68 and pages 69 and 70 with your sponsor and complete this inventory as well as the resentment and the fear inventories during the next week. Let's point out a couple other things in the conduct inventory. Alright. There's a prayer on page 69, paragraph 2. It says, we ask God to mold our ideals and help us live up to them. Last full paragraph on page 69 reads, whatever our ideal turns out to be, we must be willing to grow toward it. We must be willing to make amends where we have done harm, provided that we do not bring about still more harm in doing so. In other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem. Prayer. In meditation, we ask God what we should do about each specific matter. The right answers will come if we want it. In the middle of page 70, there's more prayer. It says, to sum up about sex, this is a prayer. We earnestly pray for the right ideal, for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity and for the strength to do the right thing. You know, so in each one of, each one of these instances on my, uh, Conduct inventory, I say this prayer. Right. If sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves the harder into helping others. We think of their needs and work for them. This takes us out of ourselves. And as my friend Bill says, it quiets the horniness when the yield would mean heartache. That's the imperious urge. The imperious urge. Use this. <laughs> Use the spaces provided on page 14 of the guide to come up with a sex ideal that you believe is how God wants you to be. All right? On page 14, there's a few lines, and you can use this, but don't limit yourself. You can write as much as you want. All right? See, this is where we get our ideal. We get it from the fourth column of, of the conduct inventory. What should we have done instead? And it says something like, the last one I wrote out was something like, Dear God, 
And it says, please help me to see what you want from me regarding relationships with others and my sex life. And I say this prayer to God, and I trust what comes. And it's not about, I want Bo Derek. I want a bodacious woman, six feet tall, 120 pounds, a house with, with a white picket fence. It's not about that. It's about what I think God wants for me. And not only in the sex area of my life, but in all areas of my life. See, there's a couple things. I can only see what I can see. And how's that thing going, AA, that we say? More will be revealed. All right. God uses people and instances in my life to show me what his will is for me. And after a while, after we have established conscious contact with God, it's become my experience that there are times... See, where does God dwell? We found out last week, deep down within me, right? So after a while, I, I can begin, begin to trust what comes from within. Now, in the Oxford groups... What they used to do in the 30s, they had a thing called, they would check their guidance. We don't talk too much about that in AA. Matter of fact, the meeting I went to last night, we did talk about it, and it was kind of interesting. Uh, but they, they had something that they called, they would check their guidance. And in the morning quiet time, they would write down what their guidance was from God, similar to what you just verbalized. And then what they would do, they would grab a hold of their sharing partner, Today, we call them a sponsor or a spiritual advisor. And they would say, listen, this is the guidance that I received from God today. How does that sound to you? you know, if I receive some guidance in morning meditation or all throughout the day, I'd call up my friend Bill over here and say, Bill, you know a little bit about me. We've talked in the past, or maybe I've shared some inventory with Bill, so he knows about my life. You know, Does this sound square to you? How does this sound? Yeah. And I'm going to believe what I want to believe anyway. But usually when we check it through someone else, it helps. Especially someone that we're pretty close to and that, and that know our story, as we're going to find out in the fifth step. Okay? Now let's briefly cover some of the extra instructions for taking our fifth step, which we'll be sharing with our sponsor or spiritual advisor during the next week. Okay. So first there's a warning, and it says on the first page of chapter 6, into action, which is page 72, it says if we skip this vital step, we may not overcome drinking. That's the fifth step. Commit to God to ourselves and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Time after time, newcomers have tried to keep to themselves certain facts about their lives. Trying to avoid this humbling experience, they have turned to easier methods. Almost invariably, they got drunk. Having persevered with the rest of the program, they wondered why they fell. We think the reason is that they never completed their house cleaning. Okay? The house cleaning starts with the fourth step. They took inventory, all right, but they hung on to some of the worst items in stock. They only thought they had lost their egoism and fear. They only thought that they had humbled themselves, but they had not learned enough humility, fearlessness, and honesty in the sense we find it necessary until they told someone else all their life story. A couple important points the book points out to us in the fifth step. It says we must be entirely honest with somebody if we expect to live long and happily in this world. Rightly and naturally, we think well before we choose the person or persons with whom to take this intimate and confidential step. Though we have no religious connection, we may still do well to talk with someone ordained by an established religion. You know, some people choose to take their first step with, with a rabbi, a priest, or a minister. And if you choose to do that, that's fine. Most people nowadays uh, share inventory with their sponsor. And it says, we search out our acquaintance for a closed mouth understanding friend. That's what we want to, for the person that we're going to share this inventory with, that's what we're looking for. Closed mouth, meaning he's not going to blab our business. Okay? We can trust him. It's important that he be able to keep a confidence. 
that he fully understand and improve what we're driving at, that he will not try to change our plan. When we decide who is to hear our story, we waste no time. Okay? So we've completed our inventory. We decide who we're going to share it with. When do we do it? How much time do we waste? No time. Okay? We have a written inventory and we're prepared for a long talk. We explain to our partner what we're about to do and why we have to do it. He should realize that we're engaged upon a life and death errand. Most people approached in this way will be glad to help. They will be honored by our confidence. As a sponsor or someone receiving a fifth step, I like to tell that to the person who's giving the fifth step to me, that I'm honored by your confidence, and I'm really happy that you've, at, that you've asked me and trusted me to share this with me. And it says, we pocket our pride and go to it, illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. After the fifth step is complete, your sponsor should direct you to page 75 of the big book, which gives us directions for what to do when returning home. What we're going to do when the fifth step is complete and we go home, we're going to do a little review, and that's on the bottom of 75. It says, returning home, we find a place where we can be quiet for one hour. We only get one hour between steps five and six. There ain't no work a step a year in the big book. As we rest for one hour, carefully reviewing what we have done. We thank God from the bottom of our, of our heart that we know him better. Taking this book down from our shelf, we turn to the page which contains the 12th step. Carefully reading the first five proposals, we ask if we have omitted anything, for we are building an arch through which we shall walk a free man at last. These are the questions we ask. Is our work solved so far? Are the stones properly in place? Have we skimped on the cement put in the foundation? Have we tried to make mortar without sand? You can use the space provided on pages 14 and 15 of the guide booklet to answer these review questions. If your sponsor does not take you through the sixth and seventh step after you've completed your fifth and answered the questions on the bottom of page 75, don't worry. We'll take the sixth and seventh step in class next week. Okay. Any questions on four or five? Okay. What I usually like to do after covering the material in the fourth step is read the last paragraph, uh, the last two paragraphs on page 70 and 71. I'll leave that up to you guys after you complete your fourth step. Read those last two paragraphs, beginning with, if we have been thorough about our personal inventory, we've written down a lot. Okay? And that'll, that'll set you up nicely for, uh, for the fifth step. And hopefully, people that are going through the steps, uh, via these beginner classes, will have their fourth and fifth step completed for next week. And we'll be ready to rock and roll with step six, seven, Eight and nine. Any questions? Well, thank you all for uh, letting me facilitate this week. And may God bless each and every one of you on your journey through the next week. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mike, and I am an alcoholic. Before we begin, let's have a moment of quiet time to invite the God of our own understanding into our hearts and ask him for an open mind and the willingness to have a new experience, followed by the serenity prayer. Serenity prayer. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and wisdom to know the difference. Uh, welcome everyone to the third session of the Wednesday morning West Orange Beginners classes. Uh, like to, uh, we have a new face this morning. Tony, right? Yes. Welcome. And, uh, it's good to be here this morning. I know, uh, I've been under the weather for the past couple of days and, uh, I see maybe one or two other people have been as well. The, uh, fall weather change gets me every time. <laughs> So if we could, let's uh, just kind of jump into the third week here and 
During the past two weeks, we've covered uh, directions in the big book for taking the first five steps of the program of recovery. Uh, last week, as a group, we began our four steps together, and we briefly covered directions for sharing our inventories with our sponsors and the God of our own understanding in step five. Can I have a show of hands of the people that have completed their four steps and have done their fifth step with their sponsor or spiritual advisor during the past week? Great. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I know you're halfway there. Aren't you? so. Good. Good. Well, congratulations. Uh, let's read in the big book what are called the promises of step five on page 75. If we've taken our fourth and fifth step, as the big book has instructed us to do, then we will have received these results on page 75 during the second paragraph. Okay. It says, we pocket our pride and go through it, illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. Here come the promises now. Once we have taken this step, withholding nothing, we are delighted. For the people that have completed their fourth and fifth step, are we delighted? Exuberated. Exuberated. Oh, that's another one. We can look the world in the eye. We can be alone at perfect peace and ease. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our Creator. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. The feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. We feel we're on the broad highway, walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. What a great set of promises. But we can't stop here. We must go further and take more action. Hopefully at the end of your fifth step, your sponsor directed you to the last paragraph of page 75. The book tells us uh, we get to take a rest for one hour, one whole hour between steps five and six. These are the questions we should have reviewed after our fifth step. If you are not directed to do so after step five, then we'll take a few moments to do so now. On page 75 on the third paragraph, the book says, Returning home, we find a place where we can be quiet for an hour carefully reviewing what we have done. We thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know him better. Taking this book down from our shelf, we turn to the page which contains the 12 steps. Carefully reading the first five proposals, we ask if we have omitted anything, for we are building an arch through which we shall walk a free man at last. So when we uh, take a look at these review questions after returning home after a fifth step, we turn to page 75 and look at the first five steps as they're written in their short form. Okay, and uh, what I what I do is just kind of go through each one. Step one: we admit it we're powerless over alcohol that our lives have become unmanageable. And I take a look at that step and I review the work that I've done with that step. You know, and I. And I take a look at the, the mental obsession and the physical craving and the symptoms of the spiritual malady found on page 52. And I review those things. And I ask myself if I've omitted anything. And I look at the second step. Second step. And I see if I have any current agnosticisms around the second step or anything that's going to uh, uh, keep me prejudiced from believing in the God of my understanding. Yeah. And I check my willingness on that. And I look at my third third step decision and I see if uh if that was really solid when I made it. Yeah. And I really look at the fact that that decision that I made was that I decided God is going to be the director and I'm his actor, and that he's the principal and I'm his agent, and that he's the father and I'm his kid. And I think about my inventory, which I just uh, just shared in, in the fifth step. And I think about four and five together. And I think if I've omitted anything, then I don't want, whether in my writing or when I shared it with my sponsor or spiritual advisor. And I see if I omitted anything. And if I did, I just write it down and, and share it at the, immediately, as, as soon as I can get a hold of my sponsor. Okay. 
So uh, let's just go through the uh, the review questions that they give us. And the first one is, is our work solid so far? Okay. And basically we cover that when we go through the first five steps. And it says, are the stones properly in place? Okay. If we haven't been following Bill's example of that arch, we're not really going to know what that means. Okay. But there's handouts on the back table entitled The Wonderfully Effective Spiritual Structure. And we found out that the foundation of that arch is step one. The cornerstone is step two. That's willingness to believe. And then the keystone is the stone all the way up the top, and that's our third step decision, which is going to hold all the rest of the stones in the place. Okay, so that's what they mean. Are our stones, the three, the five stones that we have so far, are they in place? It says, have we skimped on the cement put into the foundation? Have we skimped on our willingness with step one? Have we tried to make mortar without sand? Have I tried to, uh, you know, if there's three sides to our triangle, have I tried to work this program of recovery but skimped on the fellowship a little bit? Yeah. Tells us in the chapter there is a solution that uh, that this fellowship is only one part. The common peril is only one part of this thing that binds us together. So I take a look at that. And it says, if we can answer these questions to our satisfaction, we then look at step six. Are we all able to answer these questions to our own satisfaction for the people that completed the fourth and fifth step? Great. Okay, if something else came up during the review, that's great, too. Just write it down and share it with your sponsor immediately. Let's move on to step six, like the book suggests we do. Step six. We're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. The six step directions are on the top of page 76 in the first paragraph. And they simply state, we, we have emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Are we now ready to let God remove from us all the things which we have viewed, which we have omitted are objectionable? Can he now take them all, every one? If we still cling to something we will not let go, we ask God to help us be willing. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Don't read more into steps six and seven than the early members of our fellowship wanted us to. They kept it really simple. Are you willing and ready to have God remove your character defects that you found in steps four and five? Are you ready to ask God to remove your selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, fear, and your inconsiderateness, and any other defects that you may have come up with when you took your fifth step. If so, the book tells us to say the seventh step prayer. So what I'm going to do is read the prayer out loud, and then for those of you who are ready to move forward, we'll say the prayer together. Okay. Uh, the prayer is in the next paragraph. It says, when ready, we say something like this. My creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. And it says we have then completed step seven. So in the original writing of step seven, uh, when the step, when Bill first wrote the steps, uh, a couple of them, he, he added uh, a couple different words and then Upon uh, review of the early members, they they changed them just a little bit, and this was one of those steps uh, that that happened to. And the original writing of the seventh step said, "Humbly on our knees, ask him to remove our shortcomings." So uh, when I work with people, we like to say this prayer on our knees, and uh, and I know of many people that do it this way. So uh, before we say this prayer together. Let's just kind of take a little moment of quiet time. Yeah, questions first though. Be willing to have these steps removed, uh, these defects removed, and then right into step seven and, and, and say the seven step prayer, and that's six and seven. Mm-hmm. Pretty simple, huh? Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> and this is something we can do on a daily basis. Because as we find out, as we find out in steps 10 and 11, alright, basically we do these two steps on a daily basis through steps 6 and 7. Because these defects will crop up. There's no doubt about that. They will crop up and what this step asks me to do is humbly ask God to remove them. Again and again. And again. Sure, if need be. Because I've been tripping on step six for, for four years. Are you willing that he remove these defects? Then you've completed step six. If you're ready and willing, that's all this step says. And all the seventh step asks us to do is to ask him. There's no step seven and a half that says, okay, now God remove them. Are we willing and ready? And have we asked them? Okay. Okay, let's get quiet for a second and then we'll say the prayer together. It's on the middle of page 76. My Creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. Well, according to the big book, we have completed step seven. Congratulations. Now it's time to clear away the wreckage of our past. We do this by making amends or restitution. Step 8 says, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. God bless you. At this point in our work, we will need to refer back to our four-step inventories. From the list of names on our inventories, we're able to compile our eight-step list. We examine our list for the people we have harmed by our conduct and whom and whom we owe amends. On page 76, in the third paragraph, the book says, Now we need more action, without which we find that faith without works is dead. Let's look at steps 8 and 9. We have a list of all persons we have harmed and to whom we are willing to make amends. We made it when we took inventory. We subjected ourselves to a drastic self-appraisal. And that was step four and five, right? Now we go out to our fellow and repair the damage done in the past. We attempt to sweep away the debris which has accumulated out of our effort to live life on self-will and run the show ourselves. If we haven't the will to do this, we ask until it comes. Again, we pray for the willingness. Remember it was agreed at the beginning we would go to any lengths for victory over alcohol. Okay. If we see in the book, we see that that's italicized. So you think they really meant that when they wrote, we, we agreed at the beginning we would go to any lengths for victory over alcohol. And we agreed that. So we make a separate list of names even though they've already even though they're already listed in our inventories. By having separate list of names, we're able to see more clearly those people we will have to go to to make our amends. Okay, on pages 17 through 21 of our guide booklet, there is space provided to list the names of those we owe an amend to under each category of amends. Okay. In the ninth step of the big book, gives us examples of five different kinds of amends. Those five different kind, examples are those we hate and resent, those we owe money to, incidences, incidents of criminal offense, domestic trouble, and finally some wrongs that we can never fully write. On each page of the guide, there are guiding principles listed that the big book gives us for each type of amends. You also notice in the guide that next to the blank spaces provided for us to list the person whom we owe an amend, uh, there is a space that wants us to put 
a plus or a minus. We put a plus if we're willing to make the amends, and a minus if we're not yet willing. Some people will be willing to go through right away. With others, we'll have to pray for the willingness to do this. The book suggests we pray for the willingness until it comes. In the meantime, we can begin to make those amends that we are already willing to do. We have found when we begin the restitution process in, conjunct in conjunction with praying for the willingness, we, commen we commence with the seemingly more difficult reparation. We start to cross off the names we never thought we'd be willing to face. We become willing when we commence to get results from making the amends. So let's move on to step nine. Step nine. Step nine, make direct amends to such people wherever possible. Notice here it doesn't say whenever possible, like sometimes we hear wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Okay, on the fourth paragraph of page 76, the big book provides us with some insight on how to approach some of those whom we owe amends. Basically, what we're going to do is cover, since the ninth step is such an important part uh, for us to have a spiritual awakening, we're going to read most of the text for this step. Okay? So on the last paragraph of page 76, it says, Probably there are still some misgivings. As we look over the list of business acquaintances and friends we have hurt, we may feel diffident about going to some of them on a spiritual basis. Let us be reassured. To some people, we need not and probably should not emphasize the spiritual feature on our first approach. We might prejudice them. At the moment, we are trying to put our lives in order. But this is not an end in itself. Our real purpose, okay, our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. Right? I used to think that my real purpose was to stop drinking. But it says here, once we're on the spiritual path, our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be a maximum service to God and the people about us. In the last sentence of this paragraph, the big book clearly states our purpose for living. It tells us why we are here to serve God and our fellows. The book continues by asking us to let our actions, rather than our words, demonstrate to others that we have changed. Starting with line four, the big book states, It is seldom wise to approach an individual who still smarts from our injustice to him and announce that we have gone religious. In the prize ring, that would be called leading with the chin. Why lay ourselves open to being branded fanatics or religious bores, we may kill a future opportunity to carry a beneficial message. But our man is sure to be impressed with a sincere desire to set right the wrong. He is going to be more impressed in a demonstration, demonstration of goodwill than our talk of spiritual discoveries. How's that thing go? My actions speak louder than my words. So that's, that's uh, uh, making amends by showing someone instead of by telling someone. Both. When we make the initial approach, usually it's verbally. But in order for me not to make that same mistake again and then have to repeatedly make amends to this person over and over, my actions have to change. Right. What do we hear in the rooms? Amends is change. Yeah, now comes the work of carrying out the amend. Right. You know, if, if I was the receiver of that amend, in some cases, uh, the boss may say, well, that's great. You know, that's great. You apologize for screwing up all, all these years. But let's see some action. You know, the actions really uh, are what's going to produce the results. Okay. We don't use this as an excuse for shying away from the subject of God. When it will serve any good purpose, we're willing to announce our, 
our convictions with tact and common sense. One of the most difficult amends to make is to someone we genuinely, genuinely don't like. But whether we like them or not, we must proceed. The text continues. The question of how to approach the man we hate it will arise. It may be he has done us more harm than we have done him. And though we may have acquired a better attitude toward him, and hopefully in our fourth step we've done that, we are still not too keen about admitting our faults. Nevertheless, with a person we dislike, we take the bit in our teeth. It is harder to go to an enemy than it is a friend, but we find it much more beneficial to us. We go to him. Now, this is how, how we go to these people that we make amends to. This is the attitude that we have. And what I like to do is I take a little quiet time. You know, if I'm driving to see someone, I sit in my car before I go into the office or, or knock on the door or what have you. You know, and I ask God for guidance and direction. And this is the attitude we try to take. We go to him in a helpful and forgiving spirit confessing our former ill feeling and expressing our regret. In the next paragraph, the big book even provides us with instructions on what to say and what not to say. It says, under no condition do we criticize such a person or argue. Simply tell him that we will never get over our drinking until we have done our utmost to straighten out the past. Remember this now. We are there to sweep off our side of the street, realizing that nothing worthwhile can be accomplished until we do so, never trying to tell him what he should do. His faults are not discussed. That was really important for me because I'm a guy that likes justification. Okay? Because you did this to me, column two of my four-step inventory, I did this to you, and I'm really sorry for that. No, no book didn't say that. We stay away from his fault. We stick to our own. If our manner, again, this is my attitude, if our manner is calm, frank, and open, we will be gratified with the result. In nine cases out of ten, the unexpected happens. Sometimes the man we are calling upon admits his own fault. So feuds of your standing melt away in an hour. Rarely do we fail to make satisfactory progress. Our former enemies sometimes sometimes praise what we are doing and wish us well. Occasionally, they will offer assistance. It should not matter, however, if someone does throw us out of his office. We have made our demonstra- we have made our demonstration, done our part. It is water over the dam. The big book explains what to do about our debt. We may not like the sacrifice required to make good on our bills, but sacrifice we must. This process forces us to rely on God for guidance, which takes us out of self-will and into God's will. Under God's direction, we find it much easier to make restitution than we ever thought possible. So in the middle of page 78, I think the book here makes the uh, the biggest under understatement of the whole book. It says most alcoholics owe money. <laughs> we do not dodge our creditors. Telling them what we are trying to do, we make no bones about our drinking. They usually know it anyway, whether we think so or not. Nor are we afraid of disclosing our alcoholism on the theory it may cause financial harm. Approached in this way, the most ruthless creditor will sometimes surprise us. Arranging the best deal we can, we let these people know We are sorry. Our drinking has made us slow to pay. We must lose our fear of creditors no matter how far we have to go, for for we are liable to drink if we are afraid to face them. Okay, it says arranging the best deal we can. My alcoholic ego, if I owe you a thousand dollars, my ego wants me to be able to save up that thousand dollars, cut you a check for the grand and say, here you go, aren't I wonderful? Here's your money. You know, but something Alcoholics Anonymous came up with, or at least uh, the fellowship did, is the, uh, the payment plan. You know, and it says we arrange the best deal we can. If I owe this guy a thousand dollars and if what I can afford to give him is five dollars a week, 
for however long, for however many weeks it takes me to pay off that thousand dollars, you know, then that's the best deal we can arrange. The important thing is that he agrees to it. And if he agrees to it, we do that. We send him a sum, sum of money, and we do that on a continuous basis until that amends is made. Okay. The next paragraph deals with criminal offenses. It says, perhaps we have committed a criminal offense which might land us in jail if it were known to the authorities. We may be short in our accounts and un unable to make good. We have already admitted this in confidence to another person, but we are sure we would be imprisoned or lose our job if it were known. Maybe it is only a petty offense, such as padding the expense account. Most of us have done this, that sort of thing. Maybe we are divorced and have remarried but haven't kept up our alimony to, num to number one. She is in indignant about it and has a warrant out for our arrest. That's a, forming, that's a common form of trouble, too. Next, the book instructs us to ask God for guidance. This reliance upon God is essential if we are to outgrow the fears that have separated us from our Creator. It says, although these reparations take innumerable forms, there are some general principles which we find guiding. Reminding ourselves that we have decided to go to any length to find a spiritual experience. There they go again with any length. We ask that we be given strength and direction to do the right thing, no matter what the personal consequences are. Okay, that kind of uh, that kind of dispels the myth of uh, except when to do so would injure them or others, and I'm others. According to this book, I am not others. All right. It says, no matter what my personal consequences may be, we may lose our position and reputation or face jail, but we are willing. We have to be. We must not shrink at anything. Next, next is an example of how to perceive when other people could be affected. Here, extreme caution needs to be taken. It says, usually, however, other people are involved. Therefore, we are not to be the hasty or foolish martyr who would needlessly sacrifice others to save himself from the alcoholic pit. A man we know had remarried. Because of resentment and drinking, he had not paid alimony to his first wife. She was furious. She went to court and got an order for his arrest. He had commenced our way of life, had secured a position, and was getting his head above water. It would have been impressive heroic if he had jumped up to the judge and said, Here I am. We thought he ought to be willing to do that if necessary, but if he were in jail, he could provide nothing for either family. We suggest that he write his first wife admitting his fault and asking forgiveness. He made the approach. He did, and also sent a small amount of money. He told her what he would try to do in the future. He said he was perfectly willing to go to jail if she insisted. Of course, she did not, and the whole situation has long since been adjusted. The big book suggests we ask others to help, ask others for help before we make some of our more difficult amends. We need direction, preferably from someone who understands the inventory and restitution process. We must make sure we do not create further harm as we clean up our side of the street. On the top of page 80, the book says, Before taking drastic action, which might implicate other people, we secure their consent. Okay, again, on page 80, first paragraph, it says, before taking drastic action which might implicate other people, we secure their consent. If we have obtained permission, have consulted with others, ask God to help, and the drastic step is indicated, we must not shrink. Next is the story of a man that had to get consent from his family and business partner before proceeding. It says, this brings to mind a story about one of our friends. While drinking, he accepted a sum of money from a bitterly hated business rival, giving him no receipt for it. He subsequently denied having received the money and used the 
incident as a basis for discrediting the man. He thus used his own wrongdoing as a means of destroying the reputation of another. In fact, his rival was ruined. He felt that he had done a wrong he could never possibly make right. If he opened that old affair, he was afraid it would destroy the reputation of his partner, disgrace his family, and take away his means of livelihood. What right had he to involve those dependent upon him? How could he possibly make a public statement exonerating his rival? After consulting with his wife and partner, he came to the conclusion that it was better to take those risks than to stand before his creator guilty of such ruinous slander. He saw that he had to place the outcome in God's hand, or he would soon start drinking again and all would be lost anyhow. He attended church for the first time in many years. After the sermon, he quietly got up and made an explanation. His action, his action met widespread approval, and today he is one of the most trusted citizens of his town. This all happened years ago. Now the next page or so deals with domestic troubles. Starting with the second line from the bottom of page 80, the book says, Chances are that we have domestic troubles. Perhaps we're mixed up with women in a fashion we wouldn't care to have advertised sure that's never happened to any of the guys here. Uh, We doubt if in this respect alcoholics are fundamentally much worse than other people, but drinking does complicate sex relations in the home. After a few years with an alcoholic, a wife gets worn out, resentful, or uncommunicative. How could she be anything else? The husband begins to feel lonely, sorry for himself. He commences to look around the nightclubs, or their equivalent for something besides liquor. Perhaps he is having a secret and exciting affair with the girl who understands. In fairness, we must say that she may understand, but what are we going to do about a thing like that? A man so involved often fears very, feels very remorseful at times, especially if he is married to a loyal, a loyal, and courageous girl who has literally gone through hell for him. Whatever the situation, we usually have to do something about it. If we are sure our wife does not know, should we tell her? Not always, we think. If she knows in a general way that we have been wild, (laughs) should we tell her in detail? Undoubtedly, we should admit our fault. She mustn't sit She may insist on knowing all the particulars. She will want to know who the woman is and where she is. We feel we ought to say to her that we have no right to involve another person. We are sorry for what we have done, and God willing, it shall not be repeated. More than that, we cannot do. We have no right to go further. Though there may be justifiable exceptions, and though we wish to lay down no rule of any sort, we may off, uh, we have often found this the best course to take. You know, so the book even says, in some cases, there are no ironclad directions. You know, everyone's case is a little bit different. The important thing is that we seek guidance from God and from other people that are on the spiritual path. Our design for living is not a one-way street. It is good for the wife as for the husband. If we can forget, so can she. And flip-flop that too, because if she can forget, so can he. It is better, however, that one does not needlessly name a person upon whom she can vent jealousy. In the first paragraph of page 82, we are yet again instructed to ask God for guidance as we make good on our past misdeeds. So, So can Can you see here, when we make our amends, how we're really trusting and relying upon God here? We don't want to self-will our amends. Because if we self-will our amends, we're just going to have a a whole other list of amends again. Okay. It says in that paragraph, perhaps there are some cases where the utmost frankness is demanded. No outsider can appraise such an intimate situation. It may be that both will decide 
that the way of good sense and loving kindness is to let bygones be bygones. Each might pray about it, having the other having the other one's happiness uppermost in mind. Keep it always in sight that we are dealing with that most terrible human emotion, jealousy. The generalship may be may decide that the problem be attacked on the flank rather than risk face to face combat. This is an example of how we must be tactful and considerate of others as we make our amends. Nobody said it would be easy, it just has to be done. Remember to always use God as your constant guide. By following his direction, the most difficult situations can have a positive outcome. In the next several paragraphs, the big book states quite emphatically that stopping drinking is only a beginning. We must take additional action if we are to recover from alcoholism. It says on page 82... In paragraphs 2 and 3, if we have no such complication, and they're talking about the home, there's plenty, uh, and they're talking about the uh, preceding type of amends they just gave us directions for, there's plenty we should do in the home. Sometimes we hear an alcoholic say that the only thing he needs to do is to keep sober. Certainly he must keep sober, for there will be no home if he doesn't. But he is yet a long way from making good to the wife or parents whom for years he has so shockingly treated. Passing all understanding is the practice mothers and wives have had with alcoholics. Had had this not been so, many of us would have no homes today, would perhaps be dead. The alcoholic is like a tornado roaring his way through the lives of others. Hearts are broken, sweet relationships are dead, affections have been uprooted. Selfish and inconsiderate habits have kept have kept the home in turmoil. We feel a man is unthinking when he says that sobriety is enough. He is like the farmer who came up out of his cyclone cellar to find his home ruined. To his wife, he remarked, Don't see anything the matter here, Ma. Ain't it grand the wind stopped blowing? Not drinking is not enough. The big book makes that very clear. The reconstruction that will need to take place in most homes may at times seem difficult. But once again, we rely heavily on prayer and guidance from our Creator. On the top of page 83, the book says, Yes, there is a long period of reconstruction ahead. We must take the lead. A a remorseful mumbling that we are sorry won't fill the bill at all. We ought to sit down with the family and frankly analyze the past as we now see it, being very careful not to criticize them. Again, we stick to our own faults. <coughs> Their defects may be glaring, but the chances are that our own actions are partly responsible. So we clean house with the family, asking each morning, morning in meditation that our Creator show us the way of patience, tolerance, kindliness, and love. You know? In our morning meditation, our 11th step, that's an ex- excellent prayer, especially when we're going through uh, amends. The spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. Unless one's family expresses a desire to live upon spiritual principles, we think we ought not to urge them. We should not talk incessantly to them about spiritual matters. They will change in time. Our behavior... Our behavior will convince them more than our words. We must remember that 10 or 20 years of drunkenness would make a skeptic out of anyone. So here we're told that in order to achieve the vital psychic change, we have to live the AA program. So we don't just take the steps, we practice these principles on a daily basis. Next week we'll be providing the information for this way of life and continued growth through the process of steps 10, 11, and 12. The next paragraph on page 83 gives us directions on what to do if we can't make amends to someone face-to-face. It says there may be some wrongs we can never fully right. We don't worry about them if we can honestly say to ourselves that we would right them if we could. Again, willingness, the key factor here. Some people cannot be seen. We Send them an honest letter. 
right. Now, I've heard uh, comments made about letter writing, and the book does say if we can't see the person, we write us an we write them an honest letter. And some people, including myself at first, have taken this that I can make. Rather than do a face-to-face -face amend, I could write a letter. So when I asked my sponsor about that, when I, when I directly harmed the person, you know, I said, can I write a letter to this person? And he asked me, well, did you harm that person via a letter? And I said, no. So he said, do it face-to-face. -face. So if possible, we try to do these things face-to-face. -face. Okay. So... Uh, it continues with, and there may be valid reason for postponement in some other cases, but we don't delay if it can be avoided. We should be sensible, tactful, considerate, and humble without being servile or scrapping, scraping. As God's people, we stand on our own feet. We don't crawl before anyone. The big book concludes the ninth step with another list of results. Starting at the bottom of page 83, it tells us precisely what is going to happen once we commence to clear away the wreckage of our past. It describes these results as promises. And of course we know these are not the first set of promises we've seen in our book. We've seen promises uh, starting with the very title page of this book. Thousands of men and women who have recovered from the seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. So keep in mind when you go to your meetings, that when, when they read the ninth step promises, that these are the promises that occur in the ninth step. But there are many, many promises that we get before we get to the ninth step. Okay? So it says, if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret, regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity, and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us says, fear of people and economic insecurity will leave us. We had a conversation before the meeting started that had something to do with that. It doesn't say that uh, economic insecurity will leave us, that all our money problems will be resolved. No, it just says the fear. Why? Because we found out in the fourth step how to, re how to remove fear. We ask God. We ask God to remove our fears and direct our attention toward what he would have us be. So if we're on the basis of trusting and relying upon God, why would we have any fear? Okay, it says, we intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Are these extravagant promises? No. They are being fulfilled among us sometimes quickly, Sometimes slowly, they will always materialize if we work for them. What a great message of hope. It is almost beyond comprehension that all of these wonderful events will occur if we just make our amends to those whom we fought. But they will happen. That's a guarantee. Lastly, I'd like to give you an example of someone who could not stay sober until he became willing to complete his amends. This man is our Akron, Ohio co-founder, Dr. Bob. He accomplished making all his amends in one day. Let's turn to page 155. Okay. Now, if uh, we know anything about this book in our history... Uh, Dr. Bob was not able to stay sober until he made his ninth step amends. As a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Bob drank again after uh, he and Bill Wilson met each other. 
Bill stayed in Akron. God bless you. Bill stayed in Akron, and he stayed in their home. And uh, Dr. Bob went went on a business trip to uh, to uh, Atlantic City, uh, right here in New Jersey, and uh, he came home drunk. And it was because he was never willing to to make his amends. So it says on page 155. When our friend related his experience, the man agreed that no amount of willpower he might muster could stop his drinking for long. We're right in the middle of the page. Spiritual experience, he conceded, was absolutely necessary, but the price seemed high upon the basis suggested. He told how he lived in constant worry about those who might find out about his alcoholism. He had, of course, the familiar alcoholic obsession that few knew of his drinking. Why, he urged, should he lose the remainder of his business, only to bring still more suffering to his family by foolishly admitting his plight to people from whom he made his livelihood? He would do anything, he said, but that. Being intrigued, however, he invited our friend in his home. And, of course, that's Bill. Some time later, and just as he thought he was getting control of his liquor situation, he went on a roaring bender. For him, this was the spree that ended all sprees. He saw that he would have to face his problems squarely that God might give him mastery. One morning, he took the bull by the horns and set out to tell those he feared what his trouble had been. He found himself surprisingly well received and learned that many knew of his drinking. Stepping into his car, he made the rounds of people he had hurt. He trembled as he went about, for this might mean ruin, particularly to a person in his line of business. At midnight, he came home exhausted, but very happy. He has not had a drink since. As we shall see, he now means a great deal to his community. And the major liabilities of 30 years of hard drinking have been repaired in four. So this concludes our discussion of step nine. For the newcomers or the people taking the steps with us, your assignment for the next week is to start your amends list. If you are not sure how to proceed with a specific amend, ask your sponsor or spiritual advisor. And I would suggest stick very close to your sponsor or spiritual advisor. Next next week, we'll uh, take steps 10, 11, and 12. We wish you the very best as you leave here to make your amends. Miracles are about to occur, and we're looking forward to hearing about some of them next week. Are there any questions? Okay, great. And uh, we'll close in the usual manner, and thanks again, and God bless. We'll see you next week. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mike, and I am an alcoholic. Before we begin, let's open up the meeting uh, the way we typically do, with a moment of quiet time to invite the God of our own understanding into our hearts and ask for an open mind and the willingness to have a new experience, followed by the serenity prayer. Serenity prayer. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, courage to change the things we can, and wisdom to know the difference. I will not mind you that. Okay, welcome to the fourth session of the Wednesday morning West Orange Beginners Classes. This week we'll be covering steps 10, 11, and 12. During the past three weeks, we've covered directions in the big book for taking the first nine steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and have taken steps one through eight together as a group. Last week we took steps six and seven together in class and covered the directions for making our eight step amends list and we read the detailed instructions in the big book on how to com- complete our ninth step amends. Uh, just one thing about uh, our eight step. Um, Remember, the, the key to the eighth step is not necessarily making the list. Uh, according to the big book, 
we made our list when we took our fourth step inventory. Okay. The key is becoming willing to make amends to all the people that are on our list. All right. And the book says if we don't have the willingness to make amends to some of the people, it says pray until it comes. And in the meantime, we can start making the easier amends immediately. As we see the results of making amends to the easier names on our list, God will give us the power and the willingness to proceed with the more difficult names. Don't fall into the drunk trap of not proceeding with step nine until you're ready to face everyone on your list. That's that's simply, and this is my experience, that that's simply an excuse for not moving forward. And remember, we agreed at the beginning to go to any lengths for victory over alcohol. Well, in that case, any lengths means completing our amends. All right. You guys have any questions about steps eight and nine? Okay. All right, so we'll just move right along to uh, step 10. And step 10 is we continue to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Let's turn to page 84 of the big book. All right. On the second paragraph, and it says, This thought brings us to step 10 which suggests we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. We vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. So steps four through nine are all about cleaning up our past. Then that means we can begin to practice the principles of step 10 when we begin to take inventory. It's important to note that you do not have to wait until all your amends are complete before living step 10 on a daily basis. The book says we vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past, not after we cleaned up the past. So the book continues, says we have entered the world of the spirit. Now let's think about what that statement means for a second. It says we have entered the world of the spirit. No longer are we living a life run on self-will but we begin to live life run on God's will. Once I make a decision in step three to let God run the show, then I no longer want to live life on my terms. As a matter of fact, I don't even want to live life on life's terms. That's too difficult sometimes. I want to live life on God's terms. So the book continues. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for our lifetime. Now, these are the the directions for a daily tent step. And let's see if, as we read through the directions, let's see if we can uh, spot where the preceding steps come in. It says, continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. What step do we do that in? Four step, right? Okay. It says, when these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. We did that in steps six and seven, right? We discuss them with someone immediately, step five, and we make amends quickly if we've harmed anyone, steps eight and nine. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Love and tolerance of others is our code. So when one of my character defects appears during the day, I don't have to take action based on that defect. I can begin to practice the 10th step. And if I do act out on the defect, then step 10 also gives me tools to straighten out any harm I might have caused. Once we've gone through the process of spotting the defect, ask God to remove it and discuss the problem with someone if necessary, and we've made amends if we've caused the harm, the book tells me now to turn my thoughts towards someone that I can be helpful towards. If I happen to be at work, I can be helpful to my boss or one of my coworkers. If I'm in line at a grocery store, I can be helpful to that little old lady uh, that may have one or two items. You know, and I don't and I want to be first, I want to be through that line and now that store and I want my busy day. You know, but I can relax and take it easy. Uh, if a defect occurs 
while I'm in my car, and I've asked God to remove it, and I've seen and done my part, maybe I can turn my thoughts in the direction of someone who, whom I can be helpful towards by letting the other person go first at an intersection before I do. Mm-hmm. After all, the book does say love and tolerance of others is our code. This takes a lot of practice, but with God's help and guidance, it can it can be done if we look at it. Right. These three steps, and in particular, 10 and 11, are about daily discipline. At least they have been for me. You know, it takes practice to work these steps. And uh, by all means, I don't do this perfectly. I don't think any of us do. As with most of the other steps in the big book, we get a set of promises after step 10. They're listed on pages 84 and 85. Let's continue reading with the last paragraph on page 84. And these are the tenth step promises. And we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. For by this time, sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally. And we will find that this has happened automatically. We will see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. That is the miracle of it. We are not fighting it, nor are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we have been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. We are neither cocky, nor are we afraid. That is how we react, so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. What a remarkable set of promises for a drunk at one time had no hope at all. We're promised that by the time we get to step 10, the booze battle, and we can all remember that that battle we had with the bottle, that battle will have ended. We don't need to fight alcohol or any, anything or anyone else for that matter. It says the problem is removed. And remember, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in the mind. So according to this paragraph, we're restored to our right minds. And alcohol continues to not be a problem for us if we keep in fit spiritual condition and continue to do the things the God of our understanding wants us to do. It's important to remember that we are not cured of alcoholism, but God will keep us safe and protected, providing we draw close to him and perform his work well. The first full paragraph of page 85 further explains this. It says, It is easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. We are headed for trouble if we do, for alcohol is a subtle foe. We are not cured of alcoholism, What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Every day is a day when we must carry the vision of God's will into all our activities. How can I best serve thee, thy will, not mine, be done? These are thoughts which must go with us constantly. You think in that must in that paragraph? We can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish, but it is it is the proper use of the will. So practicing step 10 on a daily basis, like I said, takes discipline and commitment. It's not always easy to admit when we're wrong and to ask God to remove the obstacles in our path which have caused, caused us to be blocked off from him, ourselves, and our fellow man. But we have to or else we pay the penalty of, of drinking again. And once we have entered the world of the Spirit, our function is to be of utmost help to God and the people in our lives. And acting out on our defects, which will ultimately, over a period of time, cause us to drink again, will not place us in a position to be helpful. So how many of us are willing to practice the disciplines of Step 10 on a daily basis? We all ready to do that? Okay. Any questions on the 10th step? Pretty simple? Okay. 
simple in theory, but not always simple to do. Right. We're going to see in the, coming up in the 11th step how they're going to give us some directions to go through our day, and they tie in with the 11th step too, okay? The way Bill wrote the 11th step in the big book, uh, he broke it down into self-examination, meditation, and prayer. And if you read the 11th step in the 12 and 12, you'll see ironically it's broken down in the same way. And you were talking about before the meeting, uh, you know, using the two and go, going back and forth. You can really do that with the 11th step because they really parallel really nicely. Okay. So before we jump into the 11th step, let's read the second paragraph on page 85. It says, much has already been said about receiving strength, inspiration, and direction from him who has all knowledge and power. If we have carefully followed directions, we have begun to sense the flow of his spirit into us. To some extent, we have become God conscious. We have begun to develop this vital sixth sense. But we must go further, and that means more action. The book never gives us a break, does it? Except for that hour we get uh, after step five. More action. Okay, now we're ready for the 11th step. Step 11 says, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. The 11th step starts on the bottom of page 85 and extends through page 88. But as we have already seen, the big book has written, has been writing about prayer and meditation throughout the book. Right? Um, you guys should have the sheet in front of you. And I believe there's about 20 prayers that are found uh, all throughout the, the text of the big book, all throughout the uh the first 164 pages. So if you, uh, if you'd like to refer to this when you do, uh, your daily prayer, please feel free to do that. So on the bottom of page 85, we find step 11 suggests prayer and meditation. We shouldn't be shy on this matter of prayer. Better men than we are using it constantly. It works if we have the proper attitude and work at it. What does the big book mean when it says it works? In essence, it is telling us that prayer meditation puts us in contact with God. Hopefully that's what we've been doing during the past couple of weeks with the prayers we've learned while going through the, the previous steps. Hopefully we've been making conscious contact with the God of our understanding. Then on the top of page 86, they make the statement, it would be easy to be vague about this matter. Yet we believe we can make some definite and valuable suggestions. Okay, so the book says at night, the book suggests we review the day's activities. Uh, here are the directions for the evening review, and it's on the first full paragraph of page 86. And uh, it says... When we retire at night, we constructively review our day. Okay, it says constructively, not destructively. We want to build ourselves up instead of tearing ourselves down. Okay? So let's keep that in mind when we go through these questions. This paragraph isn't uh, meant to be used as uh, a tool to beat ourselves up. You know, it's meant for progress. So it says we constructively review our day at night. And it asks us a series of 11 or 12 questions. Were we resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid? Do we owe an apology? Have we kept something to ourselves which should be discussed with another person at once? Were we kind and loving toward all? Oh, that's usually a difficult one for me. What could we have done better? Were we thinking of ourselves most of the time? Or were we thinking of what we could do for others, of what we could pack into the stream of life? But we must be careful not to drift into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection, for that would diminish our usefulness to others. After making our review, we ask God's forgiveness 
and inquire what corrective measures should be taken. Right. What we just read are the questions that we ask ourselves when our day is done. Some people like to go through these questions when the work of the day is finished and they're done for the day, or maybe after they get home from their evening, evening meeting. Others prefer this prefer to do this immediately before they shut their eyes and go to sleep. The important thing is that you find a routine that is comfortable for you and that you stick to it with consistency and discipline. Uh, what I've been doing lately is before I'm ready to, to go to sleep, I lay down in the bed, I try to clear my mind, and I ask God to, to guide and direct my thinking and to help me to review my day. Okay, uh, I do this one of two ways. Either I go through these questions, and as I go through these questions, I think about my day, and I try to plug these questions into uh, my entire day, or I take a couple minutes to meditate and just to go through my day from the time I woke up in the morning until I, the time I retired for the evening, and I think about how my day went, and then I answer these questions. This is something, it doesn't necessarily have to be written down. Some people prefer to do it that way. I've done it that way for a period of time. Uh, currently, I'm not doing that. Uh, my fiancé and I, uh, when we can, we like to answer these questions together. And we do it out loud. And the principle that we try to practice and I have difficulties with it sometimes, is that when she's answering the questions, I keep my mouth shut. And when, I, and when I'm answering the questions, she keeps her mouth shut. Uh, something that we do, sometimes I don't always see things, and my partner will see them when I don't. So we have a little agreement with each other that if that occurs, we'll ask for permission. And if I see something while while uh, she's going through her review, I'll uh, say, is it okay if I touch something? Is it okay? And I ask her for permission. And I'll just say something like, um, did you look at it this way? Or do you think maybe you could have did it this way? And she'll do the same thing. Um, and it's really fun, too, to go to share a prayer and meditation and self-examination with another person. Yeah. It, it really is fun, and it's really opened up a, a whole new thing for us. And it's going to tell us later on in the 11th step that, uh, you know, it's a good idea to share our prayer and meditation with other people. Okay. The next paragraph gives us suggestions on how to begin our day. And it's the second paragraph on page 86 says, upon awakening, let us think about the 24 hours ahead. We consider our plans for the day. Before we begin, we ask God to direct our thinking, especially asking that it be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, and self-seeking motives. Under these conditions, we can employ our mental faculties with assurance, for after all, God gave us brains to use. Our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is cleared of wrong motives. So the book tells us to meditate first thing in the morning. Let's look at the sentence beginning with, before we begin, we ask God to direct our thinking. Please concentrate on these words for a moment. They are very important. It says, before we begin. Well, before we begin what? Before we begin listening to God. How do we know we're supposed to, we're supposed to listen to God? Because right afterward, it says we ask God to direct our thinking. If we ask God to direct our thinking, doesn't it stand the reason that our next thoughts are going to be from God? We call these thoughts from God guidance. The big book tells us that God will provide us with the answers to all our questions. And we will receive these answers provided we are not locked off from him. So the text continues. It says, in thinking about our day, we may face indecision. We may not be able to determine which course to take. 
Here we ask God for inspiration and intuitive thought or decision. We relax and take it easy. We don't struggle. We're often surprised how the right answers come after we have tried this for a while. So God is going to tell us his plan for our lives in the form of inspiration or intuitive thought or decision. The big book tells us to test our thoughts. Not all of our thoughts come from God. I think that's an understatement. But with time and practice, we begin to rely upon these thoughts. On the top of page 87, the book says, and it gives us a warning because it says, what used to be the hunch or the occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. Being still an experience and having just made conscious contact with God, it is not probable that we are going to be inspired at all times. We may pay for this presumption in all sorts of absurd actions and ideas. Nevertheless, we find that our thinking will, as time passes, be more and more on the plane of inspiration. We come to rely upon it. So to protect ourselves from absurd actions and ideas, we must test our thoughts to separate self-will from God's will. God's will has to grow, so it is important to discuss these inspirations or thoughts with a sponsor or a spiritual advisor. In the 12 and 12 on page 60, it says, Going it alone in spiritual matters is dangerous. How many times we have heard well-intentioned people claim the guidance of God when it was all too plain they were sorely mistaken. Okay. So it's good to get guidance from other people. In the next paragraph, it says, We usually conclude the period of meditation with a prayer that we be shown all through the day what our next step is to be, that we be given whatever we need to take care of such problems. We ask especially for freedom from self-will and are careful to make no requests for ourselves only. We may ask for ourselves, however, if others will be helped. We are careful never to pray for our own selfish ends. Many of us have wasted a lot of time doing that, and it doesn't work. You can easily see why. The book is giving us information to create a healthy prayer life. First thing is that we pray for freedom from self-will. The second is to never to request for ourselves only, but we can request for ourselves if others will be helped. The next paragraph tells us how to share a prayer meditation with other people, and we're going to do that in just a bit. If circumstances warrant, we ask our wives and friends to join us in morning meditation. If we belong to a religious denomination which requires a definite morning devotion, we attend to that also. If not members of religious bodies, we sometimes select and memorize a few set prayers which emphasize the principles we have been discussing. There are many helpful books also. Suggestions about these may be obtained from one's priest, minister, or rabbi. Be quick to see where religious people are right. Make use of what they offer. The next paragraph tells us how to practice the 11th step during the day in conjunction with step 10. It says, as we go through the day, we pause when agitated or doubtful and ask for the right thought or action. We constantly remind ourselves we are no longer running the show, humbly saying to ourselves many times each day, Thy will be done. We are then in much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, or foolish decisions. We become much more efficient. We do not tire so easily, for we are not burning up en energy foolishly as we did when trying to arrange life to suit ourselves. The next paragraph says that prayer meditation works. It says it works, it really does. And that's an ironclad guarantee. From the first, from first-hand experience, I can state that guidance has been working in my life ever since I began this daily practice. But what if we don't receive any God-given thoughts or guidance? Well, this can happen at any time. Remember, all we have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. 
If we don't receive any guidance, it means we have work to do. Maybe we're not following God's will in some area of our lives, or maybe we haven't made necessary amends. If this is the case, we need to take the actions necessary to reestablish our connection with our Creator. So in our efforts, in our effort to fulfill AA's promise of practice makes progress, I'm going to shut off the tape now so we can get quiet and follow the directions for morning prayer and meditation that the big book and many other spiritual books suggest. As a group, let's experience together what it's like to share our quiet time together like the book says on page 87. Okay, before we proceed to step 12, let's read the last paragraph on page 88, which says, We alcoholics are undisciplined. That's an understatement, huh? So we let God discipline us in the simple way we have just outlined. Excuse me. But this is not all. There is action and more action. Faith without works is dead. The next chapter is entirely devoted to step 12. Prayer and meditation take dedication and practice. If we do the work, we will receive the rewards. And the rewards is a life filled with health, happiness, and serenity beyond our wildest dreams. So step 12 says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. There are three parts to step 12. First one is having had a spiritual awakening as the result of the first 11 steps. And a good explanation of uh, the spiritual experience can be found on page 569, which is in the back of the book in Appendix 2. So uh, when you get a chance, read through that. Second part of the 12th step is carrying this message to other alcoholics. And the third is to practice the principles of the first 11 steps. So if you've had the spiritual awakening as the result of taking the actions in steps 1 through 11, then you're ready to carry our life-saving and life-changing message to others. Let's concentrate on carrying this message to other alcoholics as the basis of our discussion for step 12. Okay, we're just basically going to cover the directions in the seventh chapter for making a 12-step call. But there is so much more to the 12th step than that. Chapter 7 of the big book tells us exactly how to make a 12-step call. Here are, there, here are some of the main points it describes. I suggest you read the chapter in its entirety and discuss this con- the contents of the chapter with your sponsor or other members of the group. Okay, so we're just going to go through some of the points. And we're going to do this in kind of a, a rapid fashion. So uh, if it takes too much to follow along in the book, to just kind of listen. Because I'm just going to throw some things at you. On page 89 in the first paragraph, it says, Practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. It works when other activities fail. This is our 12th suggestion. Carry this message to other alcoholics. You can help when no one else can. You can secure their confidence when others fail. More promises are given in the, ne- in the next paragraph. It says life will take on a new meaning. To watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends, this is an experience you must not miss. We know you will not want to miss it. Frequent contact with newcomers and each other is the bright spot of our lives. The rest of this chapter, for the most part, is step-by-step, clear-cut directions on how, how to make a 12-step call and work with a newcomer. So here are the, here's the start of the directions on page 90. First paragraph. Top of the page. 
When you discover a prospect for Alcoholics Anonymous, find out all you can about him. If he does not want to stop drinking, don't waste your time trying to persuade him. You may spoil a later opportunity. Let's skip down to the third paragraph of the page. It says, don't deal with him when he's very drunk, unless he is ugly and the family needs your help. Wait for the end of the spree, or at least for a lucid interval. Then let his family or a friend ask him if he wants to quit, quit for good, and if he would go to any extreme to do so. If he says yes, then his attention should be drawn to you as a person who has recovered. Remember, we've recovered now. Next paragraph. If he does not want to see you, never force yourself upon him. Okay, let's go to the next page. Third paragraph. Page 91, paragraph 3. It says, see your man alone if possible. And that means without the family being present. It's always a good idea to bring another member of AA uh, on a 12-step call with you. All right. Remember, when it says see your man alone if possible, that means to the exclusion of the family. At first, engage in general conversation. After a while, turn to talk to some phase of drinking. Tell him enough about your drinking habits, symptoms, and experiences to encourage him to speak of himself. Let's go to the last paragraph of the page. When he, when he sees you know all about the drinking game, commence to describe yourself as an alcoholic. Tell him how baffled you were, how you finally learned that you were sick. Give him an account of the struggles you made to stop. Show him the mental twist which leads to the first drink of a spree. We suggest you do this as we have done in the chapter of alcoholism. That's chapter three, more about alcoholism. If he is an al if he is alcoholic, he will understand you at once. He will match he will match your mental inconsistencies with some of his own. Let's go to the second paragraph of page ninety two. It says continue to speak of alcoholism as an illness, a fatal malady. Talk about the conditions of the body and the mind which accompany it. Keep his attention focused mainly on your personal experience. Explain that many are doomed who never realize their predicament. Now on the top of page 93, an italicized writing, uh, looks like about four line, three lines down, says tell him exactly what happened to you. Stress the spiritual feature freely. Okay, it says we don't shy away from God. If the man be agnostic or atheist, make it emphatic that he does not have to agree with your conception of God. He can choose any conception he likes, provided it makes sense to him. The main thing is that he be willing to believe in a power greater than himself and that he live by spiritual principles. Let's go to page 94, first paragraph. Outline the program of action, explaining how you made a self-appraisal, right, four step, and how you straighten out your past, and why you're now endeavoring to be helpful to him. It is important for him to realize that your attempt to pass this on to him plays a vital part in your recovery. Actually, he may be helping you more than you're helping him. And I found that to be very, very, very true. You know, some, sometimes a guy has the guys I sponsor and uh, start taking through the steps. Sometimes they go back to drinking. You know, we can go through this work, and if we don't practice with consistency and discipline, uh, steps 10, 11, and 12, many of us go back to drinking. And I found that having done the work with them, even though sometimes they go back out and drink, I stayed sober. You know, so. In many cases, they've helped me much more than I've helped them. Okay. So on page 95, middle of the first paragraph, let's go about eight lines down. You will be most successful with alcoholics if you do not exhibit any passion for crusade or reform. Never talk down to an alcoholic from any moral or spiritual hilltop. Simply lay out the, skit, the, the kit of spiritual tools for his inspection. 
Show him how they work for you. Offer him friendship and fellowship. Tell him that if he wants to get well, you will do anything to help. If you're not just successful with this prospect, the first paragraph on page 96 tells us to just seek out someone else that is interested. So do not be discouraged if your prospect does not respond at once. Search out another alcoholic and try again. You are sure to find someone desperate enough to accept with eagerness what you offer. We find it a waste of time to keep chasing a man who cannot or will not work with you. If you leave such a person alone, he may soon become convinced that he cannot recover by himself. To spend too much time on any one situation is to deny some other alcoholic an opportunity to live and be happy. Page On page 100, the book gives us a description of the relationship between a sponsor and the protege. It says, both you and the new man must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. If you persist, remarkable things will happen. Back in the third step on page 63, it said, we have a new employer. Well, if we have a new employer, that means we're the employee. If we're the employee, that means we have a job to do. On page 102, they give us our job description. It says, your job now is to be at the place where you may be of maximum helpfulness to others. So never hesitate to go anywhere if you can be helpful. You should not hesitate to visit the most sordid spot on earth on such an errand. Keep on the firing line of life with these motives, and God will keep you unharmed. By taking the steps and following the directions, we will have, we will have the spiritual awakening that the first part of step 12 talked about. The remaining chapters of the text, chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11, are all about practicing these principles in all our affairs. All right. Just going to go through a couple examples. Please be sure to read through these chapters because sometimes in our meetings we don't give them enough attention and there really are a lot of helpful uh, things in these chapters. It says on page 132, but, we're, but we aren't a glum lot. If newcomers could see no joy or fun in our existence, they wouldn't want it. We absolutely insist on enjoying life. The next paragraph says, so we think cheerfulness and laughter make for usefulness. Outsiders are sometimes shocked when we burst into merriment over seemingly tragic experience out of the past. But why shouldn't we laugh? We have recovered and we have been given the power to help others. Everybody knows that those in bad health and those who seldom play do not laugh much. So let each family play together or separately as much as their circumstances want. We are sure God wants us to be happy, joyous, and free. Let's end our fourth session together with a couple of readings from the 11th chapter of Vision for You. Let's go to the last line of page 162. Last line. It says, thus we grow, and so can you. Though you be but one man with this book in your hand, one man or one lady, with this book in your hand, we believe and hope it contains all you will need to, to begin. We know what you're thinking. You're saying to yourself, I'm jittery and alone. I couldn't do that. But you can. And forget you forget you have just now tapped a source of power much greater than yourself. To duplicate with such backing what we have accomplished is only a matter of willingness, patience, and labor. Page 164, second paragraph, says our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we only know a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation. This is another prayer we can say in the morning. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come if your own health is in order. But obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right. And great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is the great fact for us. 
says, abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for allowing me to be your guide during the past four weeks. My hope and prayer for you is that you continue to do this work and help others in taking the 12 steps as the early members of our fellowship did and as simply outlined in the big book. My second prayer is that that you leave here today with the motivation for teaching a 12-step beginner's class or to even start a beginner's class meeting in your neighborhood or town. The format that we've used during the past four weeks is suggestive only, and there is no one way to teach these classes. Every group teaches them uh, a little differently depending on what their local needs are. Thank you all once again, and may God's grace continue to bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.